All right, King Killers, in this episode, we cover chapters 78 through 82. We discuss the character development of the crew, especially concerning Tempe. We learn that his fidgeting and other oddities are actually just his hand talk and other aspects of his culture. And we also talk about Daydan getting slapped around, him pissing off Hespa with his story of Florian, and just how weird the ADEM get with music. So sit back and enjoy. All right, welcome back to the King Killer Podcast. I'm Dan, and I got with me Weatherman Tim. Oh, what's going okay. on? How's the how's the weather out there? Is it a oh. hot one today? It, it, oh, it's so hot. It's actually kind of cold that it's so hot. Oh, it was a cold that, one today. Is, is it, that clear? It was cold. Like, hey, did you go outside today? It was cold outside today. <laughs> Actually, uh, it kind of rare on the West Coast. It was rainy all day and cold. My so, my my favorite is when uh, people will tell you uh, it's cold, like when it's like negative five below or something. Cold one out there. It's like, man, it's cold outside. Oh, is it? Is it? Because like it's negative five. I what? I didn't realize it when I was out there, but now that you bring it up, yeah, it, I guess it was a little little chilly. I, I enjoy picturing the overreaction. Oh, oh, was it? Is it? Is it cold? Like have have uh, snowballs in your pockets and just start chucking <laughs> them at them. Like was it? Say it's cold one more time. Well, it's the moment that you wish. I mean, it's the, maybe it's the only moment that you wish you actually had hypothermia on your fingers. You know, or frostbite. Sorry, where you literally are like, oh, is it cold? Is it cold? As your fingers yeah. flash off, you know, just for that moment, you know, just to throw it back in their face. Yeah, I had a Not job that there where, needs uh, to really be, you know, that aggressive reaction, but I guess that's what we're going for. I had a job where I had to walk like uh, a few blocks to from the parking lot to uh, to the office. And so after living out in California, I had no winter clothes. And then so like winter hits and it's like, oh, man. This two block walk is fucking brutal with no fucking big ass winter jacket. You're talking about in California? No, moving back, you know, oh, being. I was going to say, sound know. like a real puss. Sound like a real puss when you're talking about it. Yeah. No, <laughs> <a> not, <walk> in. <laughs> not there. And, you know, like going back into that where you're getting into that negative five degree weather, like, you know, I never upgraded my uh, wardrobe. I was like, I, I think I always had it in the back of my mind. It's like, this is a pit stop. I'm not fucking doing this <laughs> cold weather here. shit ever again. Just, just stay inside yeah. for a year, year or two, or however long. Yeah, it's brutal, man. Um, big part of the reason why I've never really thought about going back, because it's just too, it's too cold, man. The winter is too, mother, too, too fucking cold. No, my body's but, not made for cold weather. But people I, like to claim that they like it. Yeah. People like to yeah, claim they, that. I don't see how. I, I don't. What's funny, I, though, I is those same that. people, I think, really, really enjoy when it's 80 degrees and sunny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 75 like, and sunny. I bet they really like that probably more than when it's 18 degrees and windy. I mean, it's like 80, I guess. pretty much all winter, like for. A good five straight months is pretty much eighty and sunny every day for me, and I much prefer that. Sounds brutal. Yeah. It's what do you much, do when you go outside? Better. How do you survive? I, I never even check the weather. I never even check it because I assume it's going to be fucking nice as shit. And then when it's like sixty degrees out, I'm like, "What the fuck is this shit?" So fucking brutal cold winters sprung up here. So do you have? Um... You know, five months worth of white T-shirts that say, what a nice day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm always going around telling everybody how nice the, the day is today. Actually, what I what I think would be best is, nice day, comma, huh? Question yeah. mark? Yeah. <laughs> and just all day people going, yeah, it is. Like, you guys 
for two people who complain about people talking about the weather a lot, you guys talk about the fucking weather an awful lot. <laughs> oh, well, we're we're fantasizing about talking about it yeah. because I wouldn't actually do it. Well, I was going to say I wouldn't actually do it in real life, but I guess this is real. Is this real right Yeah, now? this is fake life, so we can do that. Oh, this isn't life. real. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well. But uh, we got chapter 78 to start off. Another road. Another forest, chapter 78, another road, another forest. And in this chapter, Kavoth and the crew discuss how they would uh, react if they get captured by the bandits, what they would do. They make a plan. Then Daydan and uh, Tempe get into a little bit of uh, fisticuffs, and Kavoth and Tempe have a conversation, and Kavoth kind of wheedles out more information out of him on uh, on his ability to communicate. Yeah, it's a pretty good uh, kind of get-to-know-you uh, situation with the, uh, you said the crew here. Is this yeah. the new crew? This is the two live crew? Would you call yeah. this two live crew? Yeah, it kind of feels four, like it. Four, five live crew. The fi- Okay. Uh, all right. Um, but yeah, it starts out with uh, Dan- Day Dan's a little, a little hungover, a little, a little peak- peckish um, and hungover, and uh, Kavoth's taking pleasure in that. And I kind of did as well, because he was... I don't know. You get the impression early on that he's kind of a dick, you know, and that actually kind of lasts throughout. Or he's more annoying, I guess. Yeah. Really kind of take pleasure when he's struggling a little bit. It's funny. What? Fun. You know, he did. He didn't. Uh, he didn't complain. So he just did his did his task. He he just dealt with the fact that he was hung over. Well, but he was walking around just going. Whoa. Yeah, I, I, I doubt he was doing that. <laughs> it says, it says, unless the occasional low moan can be counted as a word. Didn't offer a word of complaint, except for occasional. It was occasional. He wasn't just walking around going. He's he's going, oh, oh, God. Oh, yeah. God. Never <laughs> again. I'm never going to drink again. <laughs> I promise. Cure this hangover for me and I'll never drink again. <laughs> uh and I, I love the aspect of like he's like now that i was watching more closely i spotted the marks of infatuation on day dan uh, and and looking at uh them two together and he's like you know despite this day dan remained oblivious to the sporadic courtship uh, hespy was paying him in return at times it was amusing to watch like a well-orchestrated modegan tragedy at times i wanted to strangle them both so perfect line for the a description of what it's like you know reading about Kavoth and Denna and Kavoth is getting uh getting to experience that in book for himself yeah yeah it's, it, it is again another fun thing that happens a few a couple times in this chapter where he just kind of goes back and forth with and I guess the chapter before he talks to Martin about how would he not know it's so obvious like, yeah bro I don't know how people don't see it yeah it's you know. it's uh it's a nice little little touch because you know Roth is just kind of having fun with the audience there as well like that's obviously purposely in there he didn't just he's not oblivious to, <laughs> to yeah to the fact that everybody thinks that about Kvothe and Denna yeah it's definitely a wink uh to the audience and also just giving another layer to how Kvothe is a young young little whippersnapper you know he's growing he's learning yeah I also I like the fact that uh he talks about Tempe, he says, traveled uh, wordlessly among us like a mute, well-behaved puppy. Which is funny, considering how Tempe ex- describes, you know, the mm. the barbarians later on. He describes them as dogs, as Kavoth is sitting and describing Tempe as a dog there. And then, but he's like, you know, if it weren't for the unquestionably intelligent look in his eyes, I'd have uh, thought him a simpleton by this point. The few questions I put to him were still met with the awkward, fidgety nods, shrugs, and shakes of the head. I like that aspect, how he just slowly but surely keeps mentioning all these little quirks about Tempe, and then just slowly but surely you learn what the quirks actually mean, that they're not they're not so much quirks as part of the, the culture is what he's learning instead of just like little ticks. It's not, that's not what's going on. It's he's learning about the culture of the ADEM. He's just learning about it through, through sight and, and not getting it explained to him. 
Yeah, it's it's funny to to see him do what most people would do. He's trying to assign what these things mean. Like, is he just awkward? Is he, you know, is he offended easily? Like, because for for a good long while, he starts to think he's like he's really touchy because the few things that Cavo tries to talk to him about, he's like, no, we're not talking about that. Not for you, type shit. <laughs> you know. Um, well, and then when you ask him later about you know singing a song, he's like completely disgusted with him so these little attempts you know he Kavot doesn't know what to take it as but then he kind of has that breakthrough which we'll get in this group of chapters but it's awesome man the way the way Rothfuss is able to do to play out that culture clash in such a a detailed way with minute details in certain you know all these different aspects of the actions the fidgeting the lack of communication from both parts, right? Because Tempe sees a lack of communication on their part and then their awkwardness, their savagery as he, he looks at it. It's great, man. I Except like that, he, that he at least understands together. why, why they're doing what they're doing. Like he, he, he understands they have a different custom that they, you know, mm-hmm. they make their facial expressions to describe their emotions well, rather than fucking hand signaling. So he understands what's going on, even if he doesn't um, understand all the language and doesn't pick up on everything that's being said. He at least understands that this is just a different culture. Kavoth has no clue why Tempe won't look him in the eye, why he mm-hmm. fucking fidgeted, fidgets so much. And, and you know, he, he doesn't have any kind of facial expressions. He's just always got a blank look on his face. So Kvothe doesn't have a clue why Tempe's doing what he's doing, whereas Tempe at least understands why they do what they do. He just thinks they're fucking barbaric. Well, yeah, I mean, Tempe's the visitor to them, right? He's yeah. visiting their their way of life. It's not the other way around, so that makes sense. But yeah, but, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I, again, I just, for me, it's a huge compliment to Rothfuss because of the way he was able, he's able to work it out and to do it judiciously, right? He does it slowly, surely sort of feeds it to us rather than just giving us, giving it all to us at once. He does that a lot in these chapters, which are really great, man. It's part of why the, this, this second book is so good with the world being built out in the way that he does it. It's awesome because the dichotomies always, uh, shown, you know, between the different characters, and it, and it also is a great build up to move us eventually into a dim ray or dim ra. Yeah, I mean, they like the where he comments, you know, rain would make this road another road, this forest another forest. He said each word distinctly, as if he'd been deliberating on the statement all day. For all I knew, he had like that. That's an example of you know he's kind of building out their culture because a big part of their culture you later learn is you know they tried to say as much with as little uh, as possible, mm-hmm. and so you know they cut their sentences off short and just instead of saying like you know she is beautiful they just say beautiful, and they try to cut it down to as few words as possible and then let the person who's receiving those words. Uh, contemplate them and, and come up with their own meanings for everything, which is, is similar to the way Rothfuss writes a lot. Whereas yeah. much of his book is written. It's a, it's all about the implications rather than explicitly telling you what to think. It's, it gives you a lot of clues and lets you, you know, he, he makes implications, but lets you kind of come to your own conclusions on a lot of these things. It's very, it's uh very poetic, you know, it's a, it's sort of a, a poetic trait to kind of give what would be in a way the gist without bludgeoning you over the head with the details. Yeah. At least that's the way I look at it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's allowing the the reader, you know, and same thing with like their culture and with what he's doing there is it's allowing the reader or the, the listener to make their own conclusions about things, to be able to think about things rather than, you know, being preached to and, and told what to think. It's just given, see, and it's similar to what he talks about with like a load and, and everything is it's a big aspect of the, this book is, you know, uh, taking in the questions is more important than getting the answers. It's getting the questions and on at them, trying to figure them out, which is a lot of what, you know, what, what we do with the podcast, what a lot of people do with this series more so than, the pre- most series that I come across 
is trying to figure out things and and taking all these questions and trying to figure them out yourself rather than necessarily just waiting for Rothfuss to give you the answer. It's trying to kind of figure things out on your own. Yeah, I mean that's and that's kind of the the fun of it. It's also it ties in. I <laughs> it's funny we we talked about in that that bonus episode just recently about how Rothfuss uh said, you know, I don't I don't know what a theme is. It's st- things like this tie into the theme of becoming an adult, you know, or like weaving your way through the world and finding significance in actions and events of your own life and finding significance in in stories themselves. And that's what this whole book is, stories within stories. There's significance in just that and 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 not explicitly stating what exactly you're supposed to take out of it, but showing it through example. And then, you know, you tie the loose ends, so to speak. Yeah. The puzzle pieces fitting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's what I prefer in a book. I don't like when yeah. authors bludgeon me to death with what their, their purpose is, their agenda. I don't like when, you know, it's clear someone's got an agenda. It, it immediately puts me on guard where now I don't want, I don't want to accept what they're trying to push down my fucking face. Like it's like I'm I immediately I'm gonna get defensive and be like, no, nope, no, nope, I'm not accepting what you're selling. If you're trying to sell it, me what, something, I'm not buying. It also cheap. It just cheapens the message. You know, there's less artistry involved. And yeah. once once you can feel the agenda is being pushed, and you you don't you kind of yeah you don't want to participate because now you're like, well now I'm not even like part of this. No, I'm just the receiver rather than being part rather than participating in the story in itself, you know. Yeah, and the evolution of it. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's not preferred, you know. It's not the preferred way to way to appeal to me as a reader. I no, not for entertainment. If I want to be lectured to, I'll go for you know. I'm looking at for a specific thing. I'm looking for information, like knowledge that you know on a on a topic that you're you know an expert on and then i do want to lecture yeah but (laughs) not uh not on for entertainment and you know we're we're something like philosophical type things yeah exactly i don't want to be i don't i don't want to lecture so that 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 sort of brings the question who's the savage here tempe washes himself all the time yeah every time they stop if there's running water he's getting up in there you know or he's using his drinking water to wash himself using a cloth. They only wash themselves when there's a bathhouse. So they may go days without washing themselves. Just yeah. Think about that. Yeah, it's I think it's it's dirty to take baths and stuff, you know, more than just like once a month. That's gross. <laughs> like, what is wrong with your body that you need to wash it off that much? More than once a month? Yeah. What? <laughs> what? What's wrong with your body? Yeah. Like what are you guys what are, what are people doing with their bodies? Like Well Mine mine for, stays pleasant for an entire month. Like what is for, wrong with yours where you feel well, like you have to clean it off so much? Well, for example, <laughs> Tempe is doing some stretching routines where he sweats. No, so, see, I don't sweat. I never sweat in my life. <laughs> Imagine the the physique, the physique. Well, the man who's never sweat in his life. I wonder what that looks saves like. Saves on the saves on the water bills. I, I guess yeah. uh, that's the that's typically by far the smallest bill you're going to have is your water bill. But if that's what you're looking to scrimp on and cut back on, I guess more power to you. Um, but there's gonna be a stench following you around. I don't no. care if you're sweating or not. A month? That's manly man, it's a manly musk. Oh, okay. So you sell it as not being unpleasant by delabeling it <laughs> yeah. in some way. Okay. Oh, do you like my musk? Yeah. Is that what is that what you're enjoying? No, your house is disgusting. I'm not enjoying it. I want to leave. Remember that fucking uh teacher in, in high school that said he couldn't use uh deodorant or like soap that he was allergic to it and like he would he would constantly his shirts like had pit stains all in them, uh, yellow pit stains, and oh, by the end of the year, like his room just reeked of body odor, 
it was like pungent, like in your face. You walk into that room and you want to fucking vomit. Like, dude, it's like this is this is, you know, this is should be a crime that you're making me sit in this for, you know, 45 minutes or however fucking long those classes were. That's so messed up. Dude, it's That's hilarious because he, he would also um, he would sweat a lot. And so he would have uh, toilet paper and he would wipe his upper lip off to dry his upper lip while he's talking with the toilet paper. And so he would constantly have like toilet paper flakes on his upper lip. <laughs> and it was like this dude's like a cartoon character. Like, I, what, most, what is this? Why is that the most practical? You yeah. ever heard of a hand towel? Yeah, well, this is I mean, coming from a guy who's like, I can't use uh, deodorant or soap. And so there is must be no alternative on the planet. To uh, cleanse myself. Other than toilet paper. Yeah. That's how you dab sweat. Yeah. Stutes. He was a a cartoon character. It was like, what the fuck is this? I remember, so I never had, I never had the the teacher, but I do, I heard about him so much that I was like, oh man, I kind of want to be in this class. And if I bring that up, everyone would be like, no, you don't. It's not worth it. He it's would, uh, worth it. if you fell asleep in his class, he would like come up and like take a book and just slam it down, um, next to you to like scare you awake. And so he did that to me and, um, I just didn't even budge. Like it woke me <laughs> up, but I knew that that's what he was doing. He was going for it. So I just didn't even budge. And I just kept laying there until you like, he just stood over me. I could feel him standing over me. And then eventually he just walked away and went back up to the front of the class. Just like ass for one toilet paper. Waited you out, buddy. I'm, I, you know, I'm surprised people didn't start like doing like they'd wet. I'm surprised people wouldn't like wet their lip and dab it with toilet paper. And everybody walks in with a toilet paper Hitler stash. Yeah, just yeah. an homage. Yeah, to you know the teacher. We love you so much. You oh, freaking man. weirdo. He was a fucking clown. Uh but yeah. So Tempe and him would not get along. <laughs> I don't who I mean is there a demographic of people that I've never come across come across or heard of someone like that personally I yeah he's the only person I've ever met in uh in my life that was like that I I mean he was a singular character that couldn't couldn't use soap or deodorant so he just apparently didn't bathe and he sweat a lot Sweat a lot to the point where his upper lip was always sweaty, apparently, that he needed toilet paper to constantly dab it. Man, what was going on with that dude's diet? There's something. Well, go- there's like, something dude, grow a mustache or something. Let, like, get get a mustache up there to absorb some of that fucking moisture. <laughs> like, what is going on with your upper lip? Why, like, I've never f- have felt the need to dab my upper lip like because it's so sweaty all the time. That's a, that's very strange, yeah. To just sweat in a room, just talking to be unless like you're super nervous. Maybe you just need to start playing sports and then like get it out, and then yeah. the rest of the day it's like you're you're you've been normalized or I, I don't know. Dude's got some real problems. Um, but yeah. So then we also we learn more about these other characters. We get that you know I, I grew increasingly anxious. Uh, Martin was the only one of us truly suited to this work. Day Dan and Hespa would be good in a fight, but they were troublesome to work with. Day Dan was argumentative and stubborn. Hespa was lazy. She rarely per- uh, rarely helped prepare meals or clean up afterwards unless she a- she was asked. And even then, her help was so grudging it was it was barely any help at all. It's, I love the aspect of point. like she just does nothing to help whatsoever unless you tell her to. And then she just does like the bare fucking minimum. Like, hey, can you at least like clean your fork? And she just like licks both sides. That's so annoying. There you that, go. That would, that would that would annoy the hell out of me. Like having to having to work with that person on anything, on any type of project or something would be God, dude. That would annoy the piss out of me. And the worst part about that, too, is what she's looking for is eventually what she'd get. you just be like, well, forget it. I'm just not going to ask her to help. Yeah. And then, <laughs> I mean, uh, it sucks. Like a freaking war of attrition that you don't even want to be involved in. Yeah. It, it, God, it'd be so fucking annoying. Like every day, like, hey, can you like gather some fucking wood? Like, clearly, we do this every day. Like, I everybody else is doing shit 
Like, we clearly need wood. Can you do that? Do I have to fucking ask you every single day? She's the type of person that you're gathering. So, like, when I used to go camping a lot more often, um, I'd gather a bunch of wood, bring it up the hill, and put it, like, at the top of the hill so I could then, once I'm done, move all that stuff to my site. So I'm doing that, right? And I go back down, I come back up, I'm like, where the fuck? Where's my pile of wood? And some jerk off picked up the wood and like put it at his site. Yeah. I'm like, oh, did you get did you find some wood? Where'd you where'd you oh, did you find it right there? Wasn't that convenient? Who would have put all the wood there? Who would have just gathered wood yeah. for you so you could just have it just conveniently right by your site? Wow, how how would that have worked out? Oh, yeah, God strange. was shining down on me. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. I've I've I mean, really you know I've just really I've been really good this week and you know it's fucking paying off. Finally, fucking things are going my way. I was really I was not looking forward to like collecting a bunch of wood, and it was so much easier than I thought it was going to be. It, yeah, like literally, this dude's like, "Wow, they have really good rangers here. Yeah, this is really nice. Like right by the site, just bundles of wood. How convenient. I, are there beavers in this area? Like." <laughs> Like massive ones, yeah. <laughs> oh, who's that? That guy down the hill sweating. What's what's he doing? Oh, is he gathering wood for himself? Why did he not see all these oh. big piles? <laughs> no, look, you should have. There was a pile up here. You sh- you should have just grabbed from that. But you know, just like hang out. I bet you the beavers will bring more back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's her style. I think. Yeah. I think she she and she'll grab one piece and drag it. She won't even pick it up. She'll drag it behind her. Lazy, lazy ass. Is it Hespi? Hespa? Uh, Hespa is how I say it. But, you know, whatever. So they they start talking about what they're going to do, like how they're going to do everything. It's like, so, oh, okay, here's the road, about 20 miles of it. Uh, meals, the soft voice was Tempe's, excuse me, I asked. Uh, this was the first thing I'd heard him say in a day and a half. Mills? His accent was so thick around the unfamiliar word that it took me a second to understand. He was trying to say miles. Miles, I said distinctly. I pointed in the direction of the road and held up one finger. From here to the road is one mile. Today we walked 15 miles. He nodded once. So you starting to get the idea that he, not only is it he, he's different culturally, he also he just doesn't understand the language that well he doesn't have mastery over the language so he doesn't understand you know half of what they're saying yeah so i mean he's just he's along for the ride you know he's basically there to help and to be of assistance in some way but yeah that would be that'd be difficult for me to just to be riding along like i have no idea what's being said well he, he does he knows most of what is being said he just doesn't know all the words and so a lot of you know Oh, that's right he gets most but yeah yeah, some of the the distinctions he, he's missing. But they talk about, you know, it's safe to assume the bandits are within 10 miles of the road. I drew a box around my crude sketch of the road that gives us 400 square miles of forest to search. There was a moment of silence as everyone absorbed that piece of information. Finally, Tempe spoke. This, that is large. It's like, yeah, no shit. I mean, is it safe to assume that they're within 10 miles of the road? That's I mean, what, are we just accepting that because he says it? Because yeah. I mean, when he said it, I, when I was reading it, I'm like, is it though? I mean, I guess it's a book and that's what he's saying. So that's what we're rolling with. But I was curious. Mm-hmm. How why would the, why would happen? the, well, I mean, we know that they, they're not that far because we see later on that they're not, it's not like they have to walk fucking 30, 40 miles into the woods to yeah. find them. I understand that, but. I don't know. I, it, for me, it just it was kind of one of those things where I'm like, but is it actually safe to assume that they're within 10 miles? Well, you would think. Like, I mean, how else are you waylaying, you know, waylaying tax collectors and shit if, you, if you're, if you you know, 60 miles away? We might have talked about this, but is this something that's been repetitious? I mean, they're just out yes. doing this repeatedly? Yeah, they've been there. repeatedly fucking it robbing like people on the roads. Time. Yeah. Okay. So that makes more sense. So yeah. they're just basically like, they have this... This is their cash crop now, and this is yeah. what they're rolling with. Yeah, that's uh, they're just uh, obviously Cinder's doing this more than likely because he's trying to cause problems between Roderick and the mayor. 
So if you're going to be doing that, it's not just rob, you know, rob the mayor's tax collector once. You got to keep fucking robbing it over and over again. Plus, make the road dangerous. Might be fucking with, uh, you know, his ability to get with Maylewin because this is near the lackless lands. And so this is a path that they would go down. So he's he's fucking up their shit as well. So it it could it would cause the mayor problems with Roderick and with mm-hmm. Maylewin lackless. So. You know, you would think that, yeah, they would want to be somewhat close to the road far, far enough in that they're not easily to be easily spotted, but also close enough where they can get at people consistently. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, well, but yeah, but then, you know, it's they talk about, you know, Martin will scout a strip about a half mile wide, about a mile back from the road. He'll keep an eye out for their camp or or their sentries. So the rest of us don't stumble into them accidentally. Day Dan nodded. I, I'd uh, make sure I was at least four miles from the road before I hunkered down and made a, a habit of killing folk. I think so too. I agreed, but they have to make their way to, to the road sooner or later. They have to post lookouts, travel back and forth for ambushes. They need uh, to reprovision themselves since they've been here for s- several months. Odds are they've worn some sort of trail, which they really they they haven't much like as. When, and you know, obviously these guys knew what they were doing because if they've been doing this for several months and it was extremely difficult for, for this group to find them. And it, t- it took Tempe stumbling on a couple of their guys coming out of the woods. That's how they found them. They didn't track them down. They found them coming out of the woods. Yeah. That, I mean, that does say a lot in terms of their, their capability, uh, unless this was a new area, like specifically that they were around but they're searching for quite a while and yeah, it doesn't seem to be pretty uh pretty good at what they do yeah and it doesn't sound like a new area because when they do find the group they've got a camp set up and it's they're ready you know the a camp set up to the point that they're ready to throw up walls and shit when they see you know that uh, yeah. they're under attack so they're pretty well hunkered down where they're at but yeah I was gonna say I like I like their plan uh, w- with what Kavoth comes out with. He's uh, he's doing pretty good. It seems at his uh, his profession here or his you know his role he's put in. Yeah, it's I mean, and it's you know there's not much else you could do. I mean, you're you basically just gonna have to look for look for signs of them, and and it would be it'd be pretty difficult when you only really got one tracker, like is it if. It's like, you know, with all of them looking, they don't they don't find any clues of the bandits, Mm -hmm. you know, there. But really, the only one who really knows what he's doing is Mark. And so you got a bunch of amateurs out there trying to look for clues. And so they did. They really got super lucky to stumble on them by, you know, happen. You know, Tempe happens to run into one of them. It's not they don't find clues. So they just Mm -hmm. get super lucky eventually. But yeah, he does. He does give them give them a plan of action, and it's it's interesting how they go about it. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense for for the limitations they have, and like yeah, like you said, I mean, they're very limited having one tracker. So it's like a couple people watching the their campsite, and then the other few trying to cover ground. It's great though how how uh, it all gets described in terms of Martin really teaching them how to do what they need to do, but. Also like this surprise here where Kavoth brings up uh, rental wood that they'll use to keep their fire pit going because it doesn't doesn't let out smoke, right? Yeah, correct. And so you know they they, they make the plan that they're only going to use that from then on. It's good for wi- firewood, burns clean and hot, no smoke to speak of, and hardly any stink of smoke either. And um, even with the, when the wood is green. Same with the leaves. It's useful stuff. It doesn't grow everywhere, but I've seen some around. Day Dan's like, how does a city boy like you know something like that? It's like, knowing things is what I do. I said, seriously, what in the world makes you think I grew up in a city? And uh, I can't love that aspect of like, what a little fucking city boy. It's like, dude, you have no idea what this fucking kid's life was like. And he's for the first 15 years of his life, I mean, the only thing, his only experience in a city was living in the streets of Tarbian as a fucking bum with, you know, constantly in danger. Like, that's his idea of city life. 
Yeah, it's it's pretty funny. They Dan just jumps to that conclusion or that assumption based off of, I guess, his clothing. And yeah, I mean, with with, with know, somewhat good reason, the mayor's like putting him in charge, and he comes walking up like he's a noble, looking like a young young kid that's you know freshly you know not dressed to be on the road. He looks ridiculous to be on the road, and that's how Day Dan meets him. Yeah, so it's. It's easy to see why he assumes that, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's 180 degrees the opposite lifestyle that Kavoth has had. But it's hilarious that after Kavoth has like grown up hating these nobles and and kids like that, and Day Dan immediately, that's how Day Dan sees Kavoth. Yeah, it's pretty funny. And he's he, yeah, he's in that position where he has to like. I guess not talk his way out of it, but, you know, doesn't really matter regardless when it comes down to it. But if knowing that if you grew up the way that he did, yeah, you would take a not really offense, but uh, maybe maybe offense. Yeah, well, it'd be annoying if you're, you know, you hate like Ambrose and then like somebody meets you and that's how they interpret you. Be like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> like, really? Like the the people I hate the most, that's how you see me? But and you know, and especially hilarious too, because like the the nobles look at him like he's you know some like street trash, <laughs> and like they Dan looks at him like he's a noble, but he's he's you know looking down on him for being a noble. So even even when like someone sees him as a noble, it's uh it's it's in a negative light. So no matter what, people are looking down on him. Well, it seems like he's got that with the. Uh... You know, the Rue blood as well, right? Yeah, Everybody even with the Adem, like, they look at him it's like he's a barbarian. Fucking uh, Florian looks at him like he's a simpleton little kid. So yeah, no matter what group he's in, fucking, he's always looked down yeah, on. All fronts. Yeah, so Martin, uh, he's like, you know, uh, he's asking what, what they would do if they get caught. And Martin says, I just stay with them. Uh, I nodded. They'll they'll expect you to run on the first night if they think you're stupid. If they think you're clever, they'll expect you to run on the second night. But by the third night, they should trust you a bit. Wait until midnight and start some sort of disturbance. Light a couple of tents on fire or something. We'll be waiting for the confusion and take them apart from the outside. And uh, the it's it's interesting because like it shows them that both in you know not only does he have like kind of some capability as a leader, but also it, it puts into their mind that this dude is fucking dangerous, that if they can get, they get caught, he can just track us down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's huge, right? That's, that's, that's a huge, uh, sort of tell, which is, it's really funny. Cause when you get to the end and they're, I know I'm not to jump ahead, but they're basically like, how would we find you? Or, you know, what would, what would you do? And then when he kind of tells them, they're just like, everybody's silent. Yeah. And he's like, fuck, these fuckers are scared of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, he asks Tempe and Tempe just kind of fidgets, which he thinks he's, he's like fidgeting a little, but didn't say anything. He looked at me briefly, then broke eye, tank, eye contact, glancing down to into the side. I couldn't tell if he was thinking or merely confused. Just, uh, you know, obviously when you know what's going on, it's Tempe's looking for looking at his hands. He's not looking down because he's nervous or anything along those lines. It's because he's looking to see what kind of emotions that or, you know, sentiment that uh, Kavoth is trying to portray instead of looking at his face. But, yeah, and it's, so he's taken in a completely wrong way. And then, you know, they're talking about like the, the problem is that if Tempe is seen in his mercenary reds, they're they're not going to take him for just that he's out wandering by himself. So he's, yeah. he, if, if he's seen as an, a dim warrior, it's going to be a fucking prop because they're going to know that he was, he's there as a hired hand, you know, that they, they're not just going to be wandering the roads by themselves and going to join up with, you know, these mercenaries out to waylay people because not what they dim would do. So, you know, they need him to be able to, wear gray or some other type of clothing that won't distinguish him as an Adem mercenary. But then, you know, they, they can't even figure out, you know, 
through communication. They can't communicate with him to figure out if he understands the plan at all. Yeah, it's kind of funny because it ends up being they're basically talking about him in front of them. Yeah. Trying to solve or come up with a solution. And that's actually pretty great how it ends up playing out because Day Dan always has to be a shit talker. And, um, you know, he plays right into that by – because it, how's it go? It's basically – Hespy uh, is saying that folk underestimate a person who can't speak well. Maybe he can sort of play, just play dumb and act confused like he's lost. And then uh, Day Dan's like, wouldn't have to play dumb, could just be dumb. And then Tempe's like gets up in his grill. It's yeah. Great. Yeah, it's Tempe looked at Dave Dan, still expressionless, but with more intensity than before. He drew a slow, deliberate breath before speaking. Quiet is not stupid, he said, his voice flat. You always talk. Check, 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 check. He made a motion with one hand, like a mouth opening and closing. Always like a like dog all night, barking at a tree. Try to be big, no? Just noise, just dog. I shouldn't have laughed, but it caught me completely off guard. <laughs> Partly because I thought of Tempe as so quiet and passive, and partly because he was absolutely right. If Day Dan were a dog, he would be a dog that barked endlessly at nothing, barking just to hear himself bark. Still, I shouldn't have laughed, but I did. Hesper laughed too and tried to hide it, which was worse. And Day Dan, his face gets dark. You come here and say that, and still expressionless, Tempe stood and walked around to the fire and stood next to Day Dan. Well, if I say he stood next to him, you, you'll take the wrong impression. Most people stand two to three feet away when talking to you. But Tempe walked uh, until he was less than a foot away from Day Dan. To get any closer, he would have had to get him, uh, give him a hug or climb him. And uh, I was curious. So he, he doesn't break it up because he wants to see him fight. And mm -hmm. so then Tempe uh, looked at him without a trace of anything you might expect to see on his face. No bravado, no mocking smile, nothing. Just dog, Tempe said softly with no particular inflection. Big noise dog. He lifted up his hand and made a mouth, again, mouth of it again. Check, check, check. And then fucking Day Dan starts, you know, throws a, pushes him first. And Tempe just takes the push or steps away from the push and then slaps him in the face. <laughs> say Dan gets up on it, uh, you know, gets into a fighting stance and throws a punch at him. Tempe fucking steps away from that, and smacks him again, and then Day Dan. They, I I like that the the way it was um, uh, explained, like how Day Dan goes from just kind of throwing lazy punches to like then he gets up on an, on his fucking tiptoes, gets up on the balls of his feet, and gets in then like turns into a fucking pro boxer and starts throwing triple jabs and, you know, throwing combos at Tempe, but Tempe's just too quick for him. Does get, does get in one, one punch, but instead of, you know, um, that actually, when he does connect with Tempe, it kind of lightens boot because Tempe like likes it. He laughs mm -hmm. and then they, Dan kind of like, you know, starts having fun with it a little bit too, but when Tippy fucking hits him again in the face, just slaps him across the face. He's like, ah, you fight like a girl. <laughs> then he's like, ah, thank you. I do. Thank you. <laughs> yes, I fight like a woman. And takes it, yes, as a compliment. Although they, yeah, I wonder how they would, how they would take that would just be like sarcastically ironic or something like that. Not realizing that that's, that is a compliment. Yeah, yeah, he's obviously, he's, yeah, they're taking him as he's being fucking, he's joking, but yeah, no, he's taking it as dead serious because in their culture, like, the women are the, the best fighters, which doesn't make sense f physiologically that women would be the uh, the best fighters, so it makes you think that, to be realistic, then, you know, they have to, because they are, they're, they're, they're typically smaller, but they have to be physiologically, they have to be different than just the regular men and women in the world for that to make any kind of sense that they would be the best fighters. It would have to be more, I mean, in, in terms of how we read the ADEM, more dexterity, you know, more agility, things of that nature. Yeah, cause if they're not stronger, if they're speed. not, if, yeah, if it's not strength and speed, then. You know, if they're not stronger and faster, then it, there's got to be some reason that they're better fighters. And it would have to be something's different about them compared to just regular men and women. 
because it's not like, you know, we, we see, we, you know, we have MMA and those type of martial arts and all this kind of thing. And men are, are more accomplished at those things in every, every field of fighting. So it's, it's not the case. There are women fighters in the world that do it for a living and practice it all the time. And they're just not as good as a comparable man in that, in that field. So it's for it to be realistic. I mean, there's gotta be something different uh, unless just Rothfuss just doesn't understand, you know, fighting and thinks that, you know, it, it could be the case that the women would be naturally better. It, it doesn't make any sense unless there's something different about their culture and their, their people, which also makes the fact that they talk about the man mothers makes it more realistic that they could be right and there. It could be different for them. Well, I was, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's, it is also, you know, a story. So just to make the world interesting in a more incongruous way to our reality is to have that, that side of it. But yeah, you could also be right in the sense that it's, it's literally physically physiology, whatever physical. He, he, he cares them. too much about things being realistic. I mean, like we uh, will go into the next chapter on like how detailed he goes on the, the horse riding or like when they're exploring the woods, he cares too much about making things realistic for it to be like women are better fighters. Um, that doesn't make any fucking sense. I mean, cause in, in the real world, they're not. And that's, that's not, that's not, uh, it's not even controversial. There's no one who would argue that fact. And so for him, and he obviously would know that. So it, it's got, there's got to be something different. It's got to be a clue to that. There's something different about they dim. It's not just that, that, um, he, you know, he just is making it in their world. They're better fighters. Like he, 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 he grounds everything in reality there's reasons for why he does everything. So there's got to be something different about they, Tim. I did like uh, how Tempe, towards the end of their little their little fighting, whatever, he's actually gripping Diddy and shoulder and jostling around playfully, which Kaboth sees that as it's it's odd coming from someone who's been so reserved over the last several days. But you know, he decided not to look the gift horse a gift horse in the mouth. And um, we're just happy to see him just doing something other than fidgeting. But it, it is funny to picture Tempe like seemingly in the way that they see his mannerisms now is like coming into his own. You know, he's like joking around and jovial now that he's been fighting with yeah. Dan. So it's like, you know, it's very natural for him. At least that's how it comes across. It, and it, it would be fairly easy to to be more jovial when you just whoop the shit out of a dude like to the point where you're yeah. just smacking him in his face and there's nothing he could do about it and you're just having fun with him like it, it'd be like a little kid trying to fight with you to be hard to like take it seriously and get mad yeah yeah i mean he does definitely own him that's for sure and actually what's kind of interesting is when you read about they dan fighting you're like oh he actually does have a little bit of skill here yeah you know, he does do something that's not just he's not just an oafish lumbering jackass he actually does have a little bit of skill to him. yeah he started throwing little combo pieces at him and so like he's he's more than just like some some goof like he's got some fucking he's got strength and speed too he's just he's no match for tempe i mean it it, yeah. it just demonstrates because he makes point of that they dan can fight and he's a big dude and he's got some speed and strength. He's throwing combos, and he's still just getting whooped by Tempe. And Tempe's just smacking him in the face, not even like trying to hurt him or anything. He's just making a point of like when he's smacking him, it's like, look, I could be fucking clocking you in your chin, but I'm just touching you in the fucking face just to show you that if I wanted to, I could have fucked you up there. Yeah, and it gives detail to what we've been hearing is that the ADEM are just these uh like extremely skilled fighters yeah yeah and so it's it's uh it's a good demonstration of and and you get it further when we see tempe fight in the bar but it's a good stepping stone to show that the the adem are more than just the average person there's something different about them they're they're way better fighters than the average person and i and i th i think it is more than just you know they fight more 
they practice more. There's got to be some, there's something magical about them. And in, the, in the same way, like Kavoth's music seems to be magical. I think there's something about the, the Lathani and those kind of things in the, in their culture. I think there's something magical about them or it could just be that they spawn from the, uh, the Ruach, like the, the Edema Ru more than likely spun from the Ruach in, you know, that's why they, they're likely they're, they're better at what they do. They're just better musicians or better performers. And I think it's, it's similar with the Adem as well, that they're just better fighters because they, they spawn from, you know, a, an immortal, extremely powerful people. There's definitely something to their entire culture. I mean, the, they, the way that they practice, the way that they have the Lathani, the way that they focus on, you know, like, um, not just technique, but it's like storing energy, storing power or sort of, uh, utilizing it is, is different than what, you know, we see in, in our culture necessarily, although you see it in some martial arts, you know, so it seems to be extraordinarily accomplished, but yes, they're also their traditions, which we find out with the swords and everything They have these traditions, uh, that pass down that it, it lends to the idea that there is something in within like their culture in itself that may carry weight and power. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, there, I mean, there's definitely something to them. I mean, they're and their swords are thousands of years old and they don't break. There's something more than just they're, they practice fighting. And so they're really good at fighting. That doesn't make any sense. You know, just that they would be that much more advanced where they're just fucking whooping the shit out of four or five dudes at a fucking time. Like, no, that doesn't make any sense. And like Tempe's like the low guy on the fucking totem pole. Yeah, so like, you know, like the other people are way more accomplished than him. And it's like, no, that doesn't make any sense in a, in a, in a realistic world, why they would be that much better if there's not, if there's not something fundamentally different about them. But uh, yeah. And then, so he's, after they kind of split up, he starts going and trying to get Tempe to talk more. And he's like, you know, uh, uh, we need to talk about your clothing. It happened again. As soon as I started to talk, his attention slowly slid away from me, his eyes drifting down and to the side as if he couldn't be bothered to actually listen as if he were some sulky child. I don't need to tell you how infuriating it is to try to have a discussion with a person who won't look you in the eye. Uh, Tempe, you know what we're doing out here in the forest? Tempe's eyes moved uh, to my rough sketch in the dirt, then back at me. He shrugged and made a vague gesture with both hands. What is many, but not all? Uh, at first, I thought he was asking some strange philosophical question. Then I realized he was asking for a word. I held up a hand and grabbed two of my fingers. Some, I grabbed three fingers. Most, Tempe watched my hands intently nodding. Most, he said, fidgeting. I know most. Talk is fast. So you find out that that's part of the problem is he doesn't fully understand all the language. And so he, he knows a good, good bit of it where he can get along well, but he doesn't know everything that they're talking about. But he, he ended up, he did know that the plan. Like the plan that Kavoth had, he knows enough where he knew what the plan was without, you know, Kavoth having to go into detail to explain it out to him. Yeah, yeah I mean, even as far as fire and tents, like the whole, you know, wait these many days and then that whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that he's like, you know, what will you do if they find you in the forest, talk or fight? Not good at talk. Um, he's like, one bandit fight, two talk. Or, Kavoth says, one bandit fight, two talk. He shrugged. Can fight, can fight two, fight and win? He gave another nonchalant shrug and pointed to where Day Dan was carefully picking twigs out of the sod. Like him, three or four. He held out his hand, palm up, as if offering uh, me something. If three bandit, I fight. If four, I try best talk. I wait until uh, three night, then he made an odd, elaborate gesture with both hands. Fire intense. I relaxed. Glad he had uh, followed our earlier discussion. Yes, good. Thank you. I love that. Like, he's like, like that dude, that fucking weak ass little bitch that I just smacked around. (laughs) Fuck it. I can knock out fucking like three, four of those dudes. (laughs) No fucking problem. And it's not a boast. We seem to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's telling us to what extent he has that confidence as well, because I mean, we saw him whoop up on this one guy, but it'd be different, you know, if he's like, you know, I could take two, but three or four. Yeah. He's, 
he's sort of giving us more detail about what he thinks he's capable of and than what we find out he is capable of. Yeah. And so then, you know, Martin asks Kaboth, you know, what will you do if, if they catch you? And he's like, you know, I, I'm not going to have any magic to be able to track you. And he's like, you know, they, they, uh, you might rob me, but as I don't have much, they'll probably just let me go. I'm a persuasive fellow and I don't look like much of a threat. Day Dan muttered something under his breath. I was glad I couldn't hear. Uh, but what if, Hesper Press, Martin's uh, got a point. What if they take you back with them? Uh, that was something I hadn't figured out yet. But rather than in the evening on a sour note, I smiled my most confident smile. If they take me back to their camp, I should be able to kill them off myself without much trouble. I shrugged with exaggerated nonchalance. I'll meet you back at camp after the job is done. I thumped the ground uh, thumped the ground beside me, grinning. I'd intended it as a joke. Sure, Martin at least would uh, chuckle at my flippant response, but I had underestimated how deep Vince's superstition tends to run, and my comment was met with uncomfortable silence. There was little conversation after that. We drew lots uh, for the watch, doused the fire, and one by one drifted off to sleep. But, and I love the fact that after, you know, he, he scared the shit out of him with the magic and then he gives him that response and they take it seriously. But then when they do find the bandits and then they see what he fucking does, then it's like, yeah. oh, shit, this dude is. And then they're even more convinced that this dude, he was 100 percent serious at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's way and he doesn't know he's capable of all that until that moment. And yeah. Even then it, he would be in disbelief to to find that he was able to do it. But yeah. Um, after that, I mean, it's like this motherfucker. Yeah. Like, so he's... great too. Cause Martin is like, it's like, don't, I'm telling you, man, stop fucking with him. Are you not <laughs> seeing when he's angry, man? I'm telling you, don't mess with him anymore. Day Dan. <laughs> yeah. She gets, man, that's it's so, uh, it's so insane. It's so great. Yeah. I love this fucking section of the, the fucking book. Uh, the all all this stuff with them they're they're with Tempe and uh and with the group I fucking love this part of the book uh but that's all I got on the, that chapter uh yeah me as well all right so chapter 79 is titled signs and in this chapter Martin teaches Tempe and Kvothe how to track in the woods yeah pretty badass i love I, like i love i love the it, the details of how because if you think about it, he could just say he teaches him to track in the woods. Yeah. Right. And then you just use your imagination what that really means. But he gives the details of, you know, stating how, how you show someone how to track. So then you can actually see it in your mind's eye and you get a real idea of what it is they're actually doing, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I like the aspect where he's like, you know, after breakfast, Martin began teaching uh, Tempe and me how to search for the bandit's trail Anyone can spot a piece of torn shirt hanging from a branch or a footprint prank gouged into the dirt, but those uh, things never happen in real life. They make for convenient plot devices and plays, but really, when have you ever torn your clothing or ser so seriously that you've left a piece of it behind? Never. Yeah. I like that aspect of it because that's obviously, too, that, that's, that's not only accurate but it's also that Rothfuss is is pointing out uh plot devices that he doesn't like he doesn't like these like you know someone's shirt tag you know snagged on a fucking bush and that's how like the people were able to track these guys down as they found a piece of clothing he's obviously shitting on that as a plot device and but the reason for the plot devices is because you know they're, they they just want like, these guys got away, this is how they found them. Well, I was going to say, I mean, when you picture it in your own mind's eye, and you're like, oh, they were tracking him, and then they eventually found them, I mean, you you don't really know exactly what to picture, at least I didn't. I mean, it's almost as cheesy as, like, you're picturing one of the hats <laughs> from one of the soldiers is, like, hanging on a branch. Yeah. You know, even worse than, like, a piece of clothing. You're like... Oh, so that's clearly from them. This guy left his gun behind, just leaning really? up on a, on like a, the, on a uh, tree. Like they cat kidnap a, the girl, and they got her slung over the shoulder, and she's got a a, a big basket of breadcrumbs, and she's just throwing <laughs> fucking yeah. one out on the way. The, every notice. every fucking ten feet, she throws out another breadcrumb. Like go go that fucking over the head with it. Yeah. 
but yeah, yeah no, like because that is a big thing. Like, I, I mean, you can picture like the torn shirt on a on a bush because of how many fucking stories do that. Uh-huh. It's ridiculous, but you know, a lot of them do it, or they leave the tracking vague. Like, you know, this person, you know, was able to track them, but they don't explain exactly what how. Well, it, or or it's like the 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 most used is a blood trail. Right? Yeah. Like literally a trail of blood. It's like, well, how often does that happen? Yeah. You know, they're not chasing after somebody that just got shot in the back with an arrow. Yeah. Yeah. Even and then would you really leave a trail of blood, you know? So it's it's interesting because he's like he's obviously subverting that trope. But then, you know, if, if you're going to go in, because obviously this is going to be a large part of this section of the book is them trying to find the bandits and they're having no luck with it. And so you get you get a lot of character development and all that kind of stuff is going on. But the 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 main plot part of the story is they're trying to find these bandits and they're unsuccessful through trying to track it. But you learn about how how they go about the tracking and all that. He goes into a lot of detail on this kind of stuff, similar to how he goes into a lot of detail with the horse riding. And it it should be um, a lot of minutia. Now, like you would think most authors would skip over this stuff. There's a reason that they use like the blood trail or the ripped clothing or, you know, someone leaving, you know, trinkets behind that someone can follow. There's a reason they put that in there is it's a shortcut. They're trying they're trying to connect plot point A to plot point B and they're trying to make it as quickly as possible. Rothfish usually goes a totally different. He's like, no, 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 let's. Let's fucking chill in this in between, in between these two plot points. Let's chill here for a while and let's it's, like explore what, how, you know, how the event would have actually gone down. Like what, what their day to day life would have been. Let's, let's, and then like, I'm going to explain this, this part that all these authors typically skip because it, it, it sounds boring on paper, but I'm going to make it interesting. That's going to be what I do as an author is I, tell a story and even if i'm telling a story on something that that should be minutia i'm i'm gonna make it interesting because that's what i'm good at yeah dude it's 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 so great and it's exactly what you're what you're saying too because this is typically the the little in between the boring bits right there's no there's no reason to tell the boring bits as at least that's what you think in your mind but it brings the world so much more real for you and you're in the you're more in the experience. That's why every time I picture the bandits and this whole time there, I picture these things. Mm-hmm. You know, like maybe not in every detail, but in particular, like it's one thing to see a, a broken twig, but it's another to see how it's hanging and part of it's starting to wilt. And then another part, so you can tell, oh, so they've been through here a couple times. Like the, those little details are like how long ago they were here things like that where you get those those little details that you're looking for that have more detail within themselves without yeah, and, pointing that out i'm not thinking those things you know and it, you're, it you're adds, thinking a footprint you're thinking a fucking footprint what else is there to, to like yeah. picture you know yeah and it, it adds the fact that he does this like he explains it like it, it builds out the characters so much more so that when you do have the the climactic scene like you, you're more emotionally invested because you, you just got introduced to these people. So like if he goes through and he, they find the bandits real quickly and he, he, he just rushes in the character development without like allowing you to kind of fucking marinate in it. If, if you don't get that, then when you have the, the big climactic scene, like it doesn't have the same emotional weight. It's you, you need that character development. You need to like kind of, learn a little bit about the characters and personalities, like them, dislike them, those kind of things. Because then, then when you do hit the big points, it has more emotional weight. And if you give short shrift on the character development, even if you kill off the character, like it doesn't, it doesn't have any emotional weight to it. It's not like you don't feel bad. You don't feel anything. Like the stories that stick with you are the ones where like a character gets killed or is put in a, in a, in a bad position that you actually care about. It's also more meaningful that it wasn't easy to find them. Yeah. You know, if they just immediately gets there and it's like, Oh, in three weeks later we found them. I mean, you could even put the time in there. Like it was, it was difficult, 
But without all the details, you, you're just like accepting it without detail. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, we went through these things and it was difficult. Well, I wonder what that was, but whatever. Said so it was difficult. You know. Yeah. And I mean, and, and you can, you could do that. But uh, with when you're introducing, you know, four new characters into the mm-hmm. story, it, it would be hard to do that. It would hard to be like, and so, you know, I hooked up with these people and, you know, you give a little brief description of them going to that that uh, that inn and walking on the road a little bit and first camp or whatever. But then then you're just like, and, you know, and then it took us three weeks and we didn't get along. And we fought. But eventually Tempe, you know, stumbled across two of them. And then, you know, then we went there like it, you could do that and, and get straight to the point. But th- this section of the book would be kind of weak. I mean, it would be, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, be much to memorable. it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, it wouldn't be very memorable. And, and, and to the, to speak to those details too, and, and, and how interesting Kavoth's role as a leader here is, is, you know, so Tempe sort of brings up that question. It's like, so we're out here scouting. How am I going to, you know, call you? I can't just, you know, call. I can't just like yell out. I don't remember exactly what he says, but. So we find out Kavoth sort of planned ahead for that, and he made whistles, or made a rough wooden whistle. But he's not perfect, right? He made a whistle, great idea, you know, ingenuity and and leadership all sort of in one example. But it's the type of, it's a night jar, right? Yeah. It's a type of bird that you would see at night, not during the day. So that's like, well... I'll go back to the drawing board on this one. But it was a good attempt, <laughs> you know, like get a little pat on the back from Martin, basically. Yeah. And and I, I like that it turns in, into Kavoth like, all right, well, then we'll just use these uh, twigs. And so he reached down for a twig. I snapped it and handed half to Martin. This will do if I need to signal you today. He looked at the stick oddly. How exactly will this help? When we need your opinion on something we found, I'll do this. I concentrated, muttered a muttered a binding, and moved half of the half of the stick. Martin jumped two feet up, five feet back, dropped the stick. To his credit, he didn't shout. What in ten hells was that? He hissed, wringing his hand. Uh, <laughs> I like that aspect of it. Like Kavoth just like doing. He's already seen like them freak out over him starting the fire, and then he's just like, "Oh, here, here you go." Fucking like he he does this constantly. Where he yeah. he freaks people out with like doing this l- the little magic, and then he's always like, "Oh, and I, you know, this is just so true. natural to me. I didn't think anything of it, but you know, freaked him out." And it's like, yeah. Well, like, how many times are you gonna freak someone yeah. out with magic before you realize like people are not comfortable with this? I was gonna say he's always like, "Yeah, I guess I should have warned you." Every time he's like, oh, "I guess I should have warned you." It's like some <laughs> it's dude like- just <laughs> keeps fucking farting in public, and like, man, I'm so I. I keep forgetting that people like fucking get a little <laughs> uneasy about that. <laughs> so, yeah, dude, stop farting in people's faces, man. What's wrong with you? <laughs> oh, I, I did forget to mention, because I think it is worth mentioning, um, when he makes that whistle, uh, Martin does mention the pitch was dead on. You know, so like, I think, again, that kind of speaks to Kavos abilities, right? Where he's he doesn't just make a whistle that's like the pitch of this bird. It's dead on like the yeah bird. his ear is is uncanny and it might you know be even more than that which what we've talked about with his ability with with music and maybe this isn't like you know what he does with music necessarily but his ability to get the pitch exactly what seems exactly right is uh definitely telling of his abilities yeah yeah for sure and so I I like the when kind of calms him down, like explains what it is. But then he's like, you know, how hard is this gonna pull me? He's like, is it, I can be on top of a tree and then fucking yank me out of it. Which is interesting because if you think about it, like that could be something that you could do as a sympathist. Like it, you could, if someone was you know up high somewhere, you could make a link to their clothing and fucking yank them off a balcony or something yeah we've talked about this with uh you know drowning someone in a, in a lake and shit like that too yeah like so imagine again, they... like you know taking you know taking someone's you know uh their shirt and linking it to you know linking it to some cloth and then 
tie that cloth to a fucking rock and then drop it down a well or something. And it would be like the fucking clothes would just get yanked fucking hard as shit. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, like it brings up that question that up we shit. Ask, Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it also does that, the, what do we call it? Yeah. You know, the negative of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and even if it doesn't like, um, you know, add a bunch of weight, even just the, just the, the, the combination of the pull from it. Like if you're pulling one, it's going to pull the other. Like if you got, got on the wrong shirt, that's not going to fucking just rip right off of you. That could cause some fucking problems. Yeah. I was just thinking, man, like one of the, like one of the funny things about pantsing somebody like, you know, they get pants, but they pull them back up. Yeah. Yeah. The best thing can't. is like pantsing them and then they go to pull them up and they're like, all right. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Great. So you have to stand there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny, funny prank, man. Yeah. It's just like, okay, well, I guess that's it, huh? I guess I gotta go home. <laughs> like, fucking tie the, tie whatever you link the pants to, like, fucking tie it to a wagon so that it feels like they gotta <laughs> fucking lift a wagon to pull their pants up. <laughs> uh, I guess I'm walking home with fucking no pants on. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Real hilarious. Uh, that's so, yeah, I think it is. It's like great. Super great. That's fantastic. And then if you think about it, like I remember when people do the, uh, it was the stupidest thing ever, but bag tag each other. So yeah. And it's just happening constantly because everybody has to get the other person back. So it's like every day somebody's going home with no pants. You, that stuff would usually only happen to me once because like someone would like bag tag me and then I would haul off and punch him. Like punch him <laughs> in, 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 punch him in the nuts. Like, like yeah, we're we're gonna end this game because we're gonna see how far I'm gonna escalate this if we keep going. I'm not playing this game it's like bag tag. That's the stupidest ever. Yeah, it's like oh, it's it's hilarious. Here's some fucking fun for the next thirty minutes. Enjoy that pain. <laughs> so well, and then so it does obviously make a lot of sense that uh, he just gives a real real simple like ah oh, it's no big deal it's kind of like i have it on a line just like this and he makes it look real rudimentary like it's no you know like it's not like it's a lot less uh you know l- less worthy of being scared of yeah he says as if it was nothing more than an ordinary stick of course it is nothing more than an ordinary stick but martin needed to be reassured at that point it's like Techum said nothing in the world is harder than convincing someone of an unfamiliar truth General think that's actually a- a- accurate. I-, I think convincing someone of an unfamiliar truth is is easy. Convincing someone of a um, contrary truth to what yeah. you already held is very difficult. difficult. Yeah. So convincing yeah, people, someone of of something they're unfamiliar with is is very easy. People are very e- very accepting. That's a like, like gullibility. Yeah. Yeah. When it yeah when they're already. Uh, when their boots are already, you know, they're already, uh, what, dug in yeah, on on some subject matter. And the more dug in they are, the harder it is. But that's when you find whether or not somebody's open-minded or not. You yeah. Know, give them like a couple take, pieces of evidence. Take, and, you know, think, think it's something as stupid as, like, you know, get someone who's never watched football before and sit them down. You could make up all kinds of shit and they would believe it. And, and yeah. if you think about it, it'd be super easy just because they're unfamiliar with it. So they're just going to accept what you say as you're the authority. They're just going to accept it. But yeah, if you tell someone who's familiar with the sport and you tell them something that's contrary to what they believe, then yeah, then you're fucking, it's an uphill battle. Rest in peace, John Madden. Yeah, RIP in peace. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. John Madden, <laughs> RIP. He passed Great. away. On uh, the day before we recorded this, the which was a while ago, the People number one uh, number one game developer in in uh, video game yeah. history, single handedly developed John yeah. Madden. <laughs> yeah, that was one one of the more impressive things because he was a football coach, I hear, and uh, I, I hear he was an announcer as well. But more importantly, he, he created John Madden football, which was. Probably the best football game, definitely he, at that he, time. And he did it all in his basement, in his mom's basement. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take him? 
How long did you work on this? Like three weeks. I'll oh, get the hell out of here. Yeah, he was really accomplished. This is becoming, this is becoming less and less believable. He was. Yeah. <laughs> He's he was the the Bo Jackson of non athletes. Interesting. Interesting analogy. Yeah, he's extremely good at everything, like coaching, fucking uh, announcing, making video games. Uh, was he was he extremely good at announcing? Yeah, yeah. I watched he, I watched a video and they were showing him talking about like uh, they they were showing the uh, the drinks on the top of the table, the coolers, and he's like, "So you got uh, you got the one over here, and that's the that's the the." mommy cooler and then you got the the father cooler over here and then this third one that's the the baby cooler so the mommy and the the dad cooler they had they started a family and then they had uh, this baby cooler it was like what the fuck is this what is going (laughs) on here (laughs) why are you talking about this (laughs) this during a game yeah during a game they and like he's circling it and like marking one is yeah he he loved like it was like dude this is the most ridiculous bit ever he loved circling shit. I remember no. that. I remember being very frustrated. But then, uh, then I'm like, watching. well, I'd probably fucking be doing stupid shit like that to entertain <laughs> myself, too. So. I would have ridiculous bits if I was doing this shit where people would be like, I don't get what he's doing right now. Why is he doing this? He's just cracking up yeah. in your head. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is so it's stupid. Like, hey, it's funny for me. <laughs> the fucking Andy Kaufman of football yeah. commentating. Yeah, it's yeah, nice. basically what it was. I mean, it was it's that ridiculous. You 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 think I'm, I'm well, overdoing it, but no, it was it was much worse. He went further. He kept going. Well, like you said a minute ago, if somebody sits down that's never watched football before, you just start telling them things, they'll just believe you. He was the king of telling people like the basic rules. Yes. Uh, during games where it's like, dude, yeah, of course we know you need 10 yards to get the first down. Th- thanks for the reminder. It's like let the People they're watching the game with explain the rules to them. Like, no one's sitting down. There's not many people sitting down watching their first football game ever. And they're, like, fucking taking notes from John Madden. So here they have two choices. They could kick the field goal. That's one point. They could go for what they call a two-point conversion. So what that is, it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, we got it. They get in the end zone. What is it? They get two points? Is that what it is, John? Is it two points? Yeah, king of uh, king of Mister Mister Obvious of football shit. Well, that's but what you want. All right, R I P in peace. Yeah, R I P in peace. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, yeah, I like that we talked about Tecum, and then that went to John Madden. So yeah, the the theologians of this world. Yeah, yeah. To the exactly. or philosophers of our world of John Madden, <laughs> video game developer, philosopher. Bo Jackson of non-athletics. Uh, and then so uh, Martin, the he says the old huntsman was a surprisingly good teacher. He didn't belabor his points, didn't talk down to us, and didn't mind question. Even Tempe's trouble with uh, the language didn't frustrate him. Even so, it took hours, a full half day. Then when I thought we were finally finished, Martin turned us around and started leading us back towards the camp. We've already been this way, I said. If we're going to practice, let's practice in the right direction. Martin ignored me and kept walking. Uh, tell me what you see. And then he's like, they see all the the different shit that they did to leave their own tracks yeah. as he's showing them how, how to track. And, and then he gets to one part where Gavoth had been like tearing up a leaf and like making a fucking circle of his Just leaf like droppings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, like, so, it's so great. It's such an effective way to make abundantly clear what they're doing. You know, it's one thing to like tell them, try to explain it to them. And again, hats off to Rothfuss for doing this, you know, or to, to explain it in this way, because it's, it's tremendous. This is the type of thing that makes me, makes me wonder if he went through this himself, you know, to think of all these details. Right. I don't know. I mean, for me, he he does like, cause I, I heard him recently on one of his videos and he was talking about like someone asked him how many people were in, uh, Trabin and he's like, you know, that's kind of stuff like I, I, I think about as like, you know, OK, so this city, you know, has like when he's talking, he was talking about a section in book three is like, you know, I was thinking about like this city, how many people live there. 
So what does that mean? If there's that many people, how many are making bread? How many are making this? How many are making this? And, you know, mm-hmm. and, and what kind of supplies they would have, what kind of, you know, how their currency would the work, how, you know, right? so yeah, he's like cool. going into those, those minute details of it, like working it out in his head, even though he's not going to write about all of those, those things, he's trying to kind of at least plot it in his head so that he can mm-hmm. build a realistic world. Like how many candle makers are going to be in town? How many fucking bakers? How many people are in the, you know, farmers and all this kind of stuff. He's, he's working those, those logistics out in his head to, you know, make the city where it, it, it would be realistic as much as he could do at least. I wonder if the end, does he chant? We built this city. Yes. Yeah. We he's always, when he's, that's, Slows up his writing process because every time he starts creating a city, he's like, "We built this city." <laughs> and he sits there and sings that song for the next twenty minutes. See, that's what we need. We need we need video of that where he celebrates at the end. So all the people that are mad that the book's not out, they yeah, get yeah. all riled up. They see his like, writing dude, process. On. They're like seeing him. He just he writes like you know, Kavoth arrives in this city. And he's like, then he starts saying, we built this city. Now he takes a break. Then he takes a break. He puts on the YouTube video. Yeah, Yeah. he puts the YouTube (laughs) video on and starts fucking singing it. It's like he just wrote one sentence and now he's fucking singing. We built this city. Like, what the fuck is going on? I love it. It Puts on the lights, pulls out a guitar just to air guitar, not actually play and just rock out. I love it. It's great. It's going to take forever to write this. Gets back in there. He writes one more sentence, and then he goes right back to singing. <laughs> this city. This People is, would this get so how... fucking frustrated. It would be hilarious to watch. It would be, yeah, absolutely. Just troll the hell out of that, that yeah. sector of the audience. But So that's, then, yeah. that's kind of my process. Like, I think that's yeah. good for the day. I got yeah, those two end, sentences. Like... Got it kind of started. Had hey, some good singing, like really got the juices flowing. So I think, you know, tomorrow, try to knock out one more sentence. Yeah, and at the end, you're just like, hey, man, this is how the soup is made. Yeah. <laughs> this, is how it, this is how it gets done. You want good soup? This uh, is the soup. This I is would the fucking die, man, because it would be so <laughs> obvious that you're just fucking with people, but so many people would lose their fucking mind over it. It would make me like him so much yeah. more. It's like one of the things that, that he did in the bonus that that thing, uh, where he's like, uh, you know, people are like, "Come on already!" And he's like, "I'll turn the stream around." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that sort of stuff. It's great. But uh, yeah, so yeah, Cavo starts thinking about like how long this is going to take. He, he equates it to the archives, and he's like, you know, how oh, tedious yeah. it was looking for a gram. But he's like, but looking for broken twig in this much forest made hunting for the gram seemed like going to the baker for a bun in the archives i had a chance to to make accidental discoveries in the archives i had my friends conversation jokes affection looking sideways at tempe i realized i could count the words he had said today 24 the number of times he had met my eyes three how long would it take 10 days 20 merciful taylor i could spend a month out here without going mad could i, could I spend, I spend a, month? a month out yeah. here without going mad yeah, yeah. And then on top of that, I mean, they have to be careful. They're not leaving. That's kind of where it all got there. It's like, Jesus, man. So like, then, we gotta do I this. love that he, he sets it up like that. And then he's like, you know, with those with thoughts like that. And then, uh, you know, when I saw some bark chipped away from a tree and a tuft of grass bent the wrong way, I was flooded with rel- relief, not wanting to get my hopes up. I motioned to Tempe. You see anything oh, yeah. here? He nodded, nodded, fidgeting at the, with the collar of his shirt and then pointed to the grass I had spotted. Then he pointed to a scuffed bit of exposed root I had noticed. And then so he calls over Martin. He's already like, all right, so that look at that and that. And he's like, so here's what I think, you know, here's the plan. You know, here's how we're going to fucking get these guys. Martin's like, hold on, man. I did all this shit, man. <laughs> nah, I love it. Yeah, he's yeah. like, uh, so odds are they're going to be north of here, farther from the road. Do you think it'd be better to scout things out a bit or wait until tomorrow? And he's like. Good Lord, boy. These aren't real trail signs. So obvious. All close together. I I left them. <laughs> yeah. He's so, yeah, he's so, like, he's so deflated. Yeah. I was like, well, dude, 
You thought it was going to be this easy? Like you just started? That that's the equivalent of what we talked about. We joked about one time where it's like he knows what he needs to find, goes into the archives, first book, just lucks into it. Yeah, this would be the equivalent of that. Like you just talked about how difficult this would be, and the first sign you're like, all right, got him, boom, I'm Kavoth. You know what's what's the word there? He's uh, yeah, Mary Sue, bro. Whatever yeah. it was. Yeah. <laughs> Except for no, that's not the case here. And so Martin Martin tells him like I'm I'm gonna lay these clues out there so that you guys are staying on your toes and finding them. You know you get you gotta get practice in too. Like you guys, it's, they're not experienced trackers, so they gotta get fucking some practice in. So he lays out tracks for them to find, and then they make a bet. You know where. You know, for every one they find, they get a certain amount of money. And then for every one they miss, Martin gets a certain amount of money. So kind of keep them, keep them on their toes a bit and, um, you know, f- keep keep them interested and engaged as they're exploring this. Because yeah. it's obviously going to be super boring because you're not going to find yeah. fucking clues. No, nah, that's a great idea. Incentivize them with their search. So now, now they're even, it's not just, it, it keeps the curiosity up because now you're keeping score. It's fucking genius. Uh, I've, there's so many things I've done that are like that in, in different types of, you know, jobs and things where you incentivize the 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 more sort of boring part of whatever the job is. And it just does make it that much more, you know, you're, you're more engaged because of that ulterior motive. I didn't want to mention, though, because I thought it was cool how, how Rothfuss did do it. So once... Kavoth gets his hope the hopes up and Martin's coming back, you know, uh, two minutes for Martin to come back from where he was. He's like, I had already formed three plans out of how to track and kill the bandits, composed five apologetic uh, soliloquies to Denna, and decided that when I get back to Severn, I would donate money to the Talon Church as thanks for this tangible miracle. So his mind, dude, he was yeah. reeling. He was, yeah. he was, he was on fucking gone. cloud nine, man. It's like, <laughs> Fucking, we built this city. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like, got him. <laughs> Done. What's up, bro? Hey, you see you see these things we found? Yeah, pretty good, huh? <laughs> That's so funny. That's great. But uh, but yeah, yeah, I love that whole like it, it's it's really great that this is what I remember now made me really like the group themselves. Because, yeah, they, Dan, and Hespi always kind of leave me with what we're left with. But with Martin and Tempe here, we're starting to get, like, getting to know them, you know? And Martin's a good teacher. He's a good leader. He does a good job at showing them how to do what they need to do. So he's much, much more the dependable one, as is Tempe, we find out. But then also they get their whole relationship back and forth, too. So. And even this, like with good, with Day chapters. Dan, I I would I I could have some fun hanging out with Day Dan. He doesn't seem like a total you know like just all negative. Uh, there's plenty of positive. He's like a fun, fucking joking, jovial fucking dude. He wants to have fun. He's just he gets gets frustrated and and, and stupid over shit. But he's also likes to have fun at the fucking bar and that kind of crap. And you know I could I could hang out with a dude like that. I think for me, I I can't help but look at it from Kavos position because we're, you know, we're in Kavos position, basically. So when you're on the road and you're depending on these people and this one guy's just kind of a consistent pain in the ass, that's what sticks with me. Yeah. The, uh, on the flip side though, like if I'm hanging out, like, in, and I'm stuck in the woods for a month, I, I'm Kavos would fucking great on me with the, you know, the fucking strict let's just fucking do do the job do the fucking job and shit and not not uh he's not like super fun on this Mm -hmm. fucking trip doesn't sound like it'd be fun to hang out with you know i like i like fucking kaboth as as a character and everything but if i'm just looking at it from would he be fun to hang out here like no he'd be fucking an annoying annoying boss man yeah i guess that's true i mean it's not like he can pull out the loot start entertaining people no, I mean he tells some yeah. stories during dinner, but he's also fucking ordering you around and shit, and you know you'd still feel you know, like man, like fuck off. You know, if 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 Ambrose was there, they could have done their slam jam poetry sessions, yeah. just you know acapella. Yeah, that would have been better for the story. It would have been better for the group, for sure. Yeah. 
You know, they would have been a lot more motivated. They've been having fun around the fire. Plus, they know, could have less... won over the bandits to their side. <laughs> yeah, through through. Them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's you that good. Some slam jam. Like those guys, man. They're stuck in the middle of the woods with nothing. Like for how many months? Like it was bad enough for Kvothe and them. You know, for like you know however many weeks they were there for their couple weeks. But the band has been there for months, so like they got to be super bored. They get some slam jam poetry. Yeah, they're giving up that fucking life. Okay. Yeah, I guess that's all it takes. Yeah. It's that good. Uh, but yeah, and then so it finishes up with they go and over supper. Martin tells a story about a young widow son who left home to make his fortune. Tinker sold him a pair of magic boots that helped him rescue a princess from a tower in the high mountains. Day Dan nodded along while he ate, smiling as if he'd heard it before. Hespa laughed in places, gasped in others, the perfect audience. Tempe sat perfectly still with his hands folded in his lap, showing none of the nervous restlessness, restlessness I'd come, uh, come to expect from him. He stayed that way through the entire story, listening while his dinner grew cold. Which is just another building out their, their cu- the ADEM customs where, I mean, he's not nervous and fidgety because he's just listening. He's not, you know, trying to express himself. Uh, don't they have also like a, do they have like a keen respect for stories? Yeah. I mean, obviously they got the 99 stories and, and that kind of, you know, those kind of things. They, they take great meaning in stories. They yeah. take great meaning in all of the things they speak. They're not a very flippant group. Yeah. yeah. Un- unless it's coming to you know uh, unless it has to do with sex and they're very flippant about that <laughs> yeah sex and uh nudity yeah. yeah very flippant about that and uh apparently they really like stories about uh asses falling off that's the that's that's yeah. the, the sweet spot yeah they love a good comedy <laughs> fucking slapstick man if tempe ever saw like uh fucking lethal weapon or uh or what it was it is it lethal weapon or loaded weapon? One of those ones that's the slapstick oh, version. From or naked sunny? gun. Naked gun oh, would naked, be another yeah, one. Gun. Or airplane. Oh, you're talking about, yeah, hot shots. Yeah. Hot shots and naked gun. Yeah. Yeah, that stuff. Yeah, that's all slapstick stuff. Or you go with like the origins of slapstick, which would be like, you know, the black and white movies. No, those are terrible. You don't, like, you don't like too much. No, those are terrible. That's why no one watches them. But, yeah, so then we got chapter 80, Tone, and in this chapter, Kavoth and Tempe get to know each other a little bit better, and uh, Kavoth starts to learn Tempe's language. I thought the uh, the title of the chapter seemed a bit out of place, um, that he he titled it after the third member of Tony, Tony, Tony. Yeah, yeah. Did, you didn't catch that? No. No, I see. I, I mispronounced it, clearly... it as Tone. Yeah, well, I, yeah. But I was thinking I, it, Tone low. I thought it was clearly an homage, um, you know, to the third of the of the Tonys. No, I was thinking it was Tone Loke, but... Isn't, I think Tone Loke is Tone Loke. Yeah, I guess it's not T-O-N. That'd be Ton Loke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the, the next day, uh, Martin left with Hespa and Dan while Tempe and I remained behind to keep an eye on the camp. Uh, by midday, I was nearly bored, uh, merely, nearly mad with boredom. Uh, and he talks about it. You know, I would have chatted with Tempe, but trying to have a conversation with him was like playing catch with a well. Uh, still, it seemed my only option. So he he asked Tempe, and he's like, uh, Tempe comes up to him and then like stands right up in his fucking grill, and then like looks looks down, frowns, and then like takes a couple steps back, takes a step closer, and it's like can't. Can't fucking figure out how close he's supposed to stand. It's like, you know, Tempe, how close do uh, they dim stand? Tempe looked at me blankly for a second and burst out laughing. Shy smile flickered onto his face, making him look very young. It, it left his uh, mouth quickly, but lingered around his eyes. Smart, yes, different than they dim. For you, close. He stepped uncomfortably close, then backed away. For me, asked, is it different for different people? He nodded, yes. How close for day, day Danny? Fidgeted, complicated. I felt a familiar curiosity flicker up and inside me. Tempe, I asked, uh, would you teach me these things? Teach me your language? But I love that aspect where 
Like, cause he's like for you close. And, and I'm fairly certain that it, that's an insult. I can't remember if it's like, if you want to stand far away from people, you don't find a threat or you want to be fucking super close to them. I thought it was, you wanted to be super close to people. You found a threat. That's, that's what I thought too. So maybe it's, it's like, Tempe is respects him because of the magic. Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I think I thought that was the case because it seems like the way they are, you want to be able to engage as quickly as possible and have control. And if basically if you're if you're further away, you don't see them as a threat at all. That's what I thought it was. Yeah, I can't I can't remember off the top of my head. I know when uh, Kesarat comes up and she she meets them uh, when they're practicing the K tan and the mm-hmm. three A dem come up on them. Like she either stands real close to him or stands far away from him. I think it's, I, I'm pretty sure that, uh, Tempe is, that's a sign of respect. The fact that he says for you close, and it's either because it's that Kavos the leader or it's because he, he's seen Kavos do magic. So he has respect for him in that, that, manner but it, it can't be because of his fighting skills because he hasn't seen him fight yeah. so he, he wouldn't have respect for him in that but and and with they dan he stands pretty close so yeah i think i'm fairly certain that it's like the closer you stand the more respect you have because you want to be within reaching distance to mm-hmm. to be able to fucking get at the person yeah yeah i think that's right pretty sure that's right but, i do so, like uh well and, so there were a couple different I guess I read that differently when he was standing close to him initially and he kind of frowned, I thought he was getting like a little bit frustrated with Kavoth and that like he thought he was trying to communicate with him. Then there was nothing to be that was being communicated. So I thought he was getting like a little bit frustrated, but then obviously it seems like he gets, he's actually quite relieved when Kavoth is like, uh, you want to teach me this? Can we get some, you know, some, some common ground going here? Yeah, I, I took it as like he he stood up right up on top of him and then thought like ah man these fucking barbarians with their you know not understanding not with the proper distance to stand from people so then he's like trying to adjust to their barbarian customs of standing too far apart and that kind of shit hmm. and so he's trying to mollify you know adjust to their their customs and trying to you know do what they would do. And he's then he's then he's like, well, how far away am I supposed to fucking stand? Is this too far? Should I take a step closer? And so it's like one of those type of things where he's trying to, you know, trying to adjust to what they would do and get yeah. frustrated by that. Not necessarily getting frustrated with Kaboth, but mm-hmm. just getting frustrated that he doesn't really get these barbarian customs. It makes sense. I, I like I mean, the whole thing is great. The way that. Rothfuss uses the the mis the miscommunication, and then the two of them trying to both learn um, these different customs and learning alongside one another is great. And then getting to get so now being able to see it from Kavos' perspective and being excited to learn, but also being frustrated how difficult it is. It's 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 pretty great, man. Yeah, and I, I like that when he's teaching him the language, he, he brings up the fact that one of the major problems was that Tempe's A turn wasn't very good, uh, which gave us little common ground. So we drew in the dirt, pointed, and waved our hands quite a bit several times. With when mere gestures weren't were not enough, we ended up performing something close to pantomime or a little mummer's play in order to get our meaning across. It was more entertaining than I ex- had expected. But then we also learned that it's not just the the words but the cadence of the words like the if using a different mm-hmm. cadence can completely change the meaning of a word and so they make it gives their their communication a musical aspect to it yeah and that <laughs> that that whole part um that would have been a problem for me knowing myself like when when he's trying to to find out because he's like freight 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 Freight. He's like, what the what the fuck, man? So he started starts getting frustrated because he thinks he's saying exactly what Tempe's saying, and then Tempe smacks him in the head, and he's like, you know, it's it's not something that necessarily really hurts, gets your attention, but the way I thought of it, I'm like, I would never learn anything from this person. I would immediately check out, and I'm like, ah, well, I'm fucking done. I'm not fucking talking to you. 
to my detriment, I would I would miss out on being able to learn. But uh, yeah, I just have a, a real problem <laughs> with uh, someone with that sort of uh, tactic for teaching. But well, the, 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 and the problem is, is he probably doesn't even know the word for cadence. Yeah. Whereas, so like, they, they're, well, I think what he's trying to do is, is they're, they're not able to communicate what he's trying to get him to understand. Yeah. And he, well, he's trying to tell him you're way off base. It'd be like hot and cold. You're fucking cold as shit, dude. You're nowhere close to what I'm talking about. So that's yeah, why just he was like using the wrong cadence. I mean, he's like, yeah, it's it's the correct word, but the wrong cadence. But if you don't know, if you don't know cadence, you don't know how to say that. Like, what, mm-hmm. think of like how you would explain that. Like, it, it wouldn't be super easy. No, I understand. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why he went physical because he's like, you're, you're not catching what I'm saying. Yeah. So the idea is change what you're thinking about change it worked in the sense that he started to hear the difference hey, what would be yeah exactly hey, he's just he's like you're just you're not you're not paying attention to the difference and so yeah it gets him to focus and listen but i it, it would be if someone like fucking smacked me in the face while they're teaching me hey we would have some problems and then if it's it's fucking tempy it'd be a major problem for me because like then what am I what am I gonna do? <laughs> like there's yeah <laughs> if someone fucking hit me in the face and like I'm gonna fucking start swinging, and then he's just gonna fucking he can easily fucking beat the shit out of me. So it'd be like completely emasculating. <laughs> it's like God damn it, this dude can fucking smack me in the face, and there's literally nothing I can do. About <laughs> it. Yeah, that's. Uh... Yeah, it's not even one of those situations where it's like, you know, like, all right, he can beat me up, but I'm going to get my shots in, too. It's like, no, he's just going to work me like I'm a little fucking child. Yeah. And smile about it and laugh. Yeah. Like having fun, just like keep smacking me in the face. Yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. Stupid son of a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Uh but yeah, so they they eventually they figure out like the the different cadence of the word can change the the meaning completely. It's it reminds me of you know what like people and and that speak foreign languages to us they they talk about with English. One of the big pain in the asses is how many words we have that mean like fucking seven different things, like there there like another- there and all those kind of things. Another complaint I hear um, from like Spanish speakers and uh, some other of the what they call love languages is that there's no there's like no passion in in English. I don't know if that's the right word, but basically it's not it's not a living language. It, uh, I don't speak many these other foreign languages, but I've heard that critique where it's just like there's there it's there's little room for emphasis. You know what I mean? It's like. Uh, it's just more like of a utilitarian tor- sort of approach to the language itself. I don't know. That's a, what I've heard as critics. And they, they should expand their vocabulary. Is that what they need to do? Drop more F-bombs. Like, that uh, <laughs> has a lot of em- emphasis. Well, you just talked about a word that can there's mean a lot of different things. There's F-bombs a lot of fucking snakes for- on this motherfucking plane. <laughs> like, have they ever heard Samuel L. Jackson talk? Like, that guy has all kinds of emphasis. Yes. Yes, he does. So their Loud fucking argument is bullshit. Okay, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm saying that's what I've heard. That's well, what people have used as critiques on the language. They should there watch. Are... They should watch um, Samuel L. Jackson in what's the Tarantino fucking flick? Um, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Yeah, when he's eating that fucking burger, that's a tasty fucking burger. He doesn't say that. Whatever he says. He puts he a say, lot of fucking. He, he puts a, a lot of burger. fucking sauce on that on scene, that fucking scene. That scene in particular, yeah. There's, yeah. There's a lot of like. Yeah, he plays it cool for a minute, and then he gets really hyped all of a sudden. Yeah. And uh, old boy is uh, check out the big brain on Brad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Such a fucking great scene. <laughs> the, the Roy Howard cheese. Yeah, it's classic. Absolutely classic. And he starts screaming at him about. Uh, what country are you from? I don't what known country I ever heard of. They speak English and what? There's your English. Love the and then they fucking take the dude in the car and fucking John Travolta actually <laughs> shoots him in the face. Yeah. 
with a like a laid back conversation about yeah. well you gotta have some opinion and just yeah. boom <laughs> yeah. oh man i just shot this dude in the face Damn. It's so hilarious you just can't hang out with these guys <laughs> you fucking idiot <laughs> uh so great fucking yeah. classic movie tremendous uh, but tremendous, yeah, and then tremendous. so he talks about, uh, and I, I like that he's like, you know, uh, asking him, you know, it was fascinating the different cadence, cadences of each word meant uh, the language itself had a sort of music to it. I couldn't help but wonder, Tempe, I asked, what are your songs like? He looked at me blankly for a moment and I thought he might not understand the abstract question. Could you sing me an 8M song? What is song? He asked. In the last hour, Tempe had learned twice as many words as I had. I cleared my throat and sang, Little Jenny, no shoes, went a-walking with the wind. She was looking for a bonny boy to laugh and make her grin. Upon her head, a feather cap. Upon her lips, a whistle. Her her lips were wet and honey sweet. Her tongue was sharp as thistle. And Tempe's eyes went wide as I sang. He practically gaped. You, I prompted, pointing to his chest. Can you sing uh, an A-Dim song? His face, his face flushed a burning red. About a dozen motions ran across, uh, ran wild and undistinguished over his face. Astonishment, horror, embarrassment, shock, disgust. Got to his feet, turning away and chattering something in A-Dimic far too quick for me to follow. He looked for all the world as if I just asked him to strip naked and dance for me. No, he said, Managing to collect himself somewhat, his face was comp- was composed again, but his fair skin was still flushed a violent red. No, looking down at the ground, he touched his head, shaking his head. No song, no a dim song. I love that aspect because when when you understand what Kavoth is did and what he's asking him in Tempe's mind, it's like this dude just basically like pulled out his, his fucking thing and started wanking it right in front of him. Yeah, and then asked him. Would you do that for me? Can I watch you <laughs> masturbate in front of me? No. No, which I actually, can't believe you just masturbated in front of me, you fucking weirdo. Which actually, I guess, in their, their, their culture, that might not be that big a deal, even though we don't hear a lot about masturbation. Yeah. But, you know, sex and nakedness and nudity, uh, not a big deal for them. But yeah, showing emotion through song in this way is ridiculously... Yeah, it's like yeah, uh, you're it's a uh, fucking prostitute, down. man. You just hoard yeah. yourself out right in front of me for nothing. Yeah, I didn't even give you any money. Yeah, it's like, dude, you're, you're a gross. fucking cheap whore, dude. You're gross. Keep it in your pants. But yeah, I love that. The the they're because Keep of the way their soul. culture looks at it, and both like, could you do that for me? It's like he looked at <laughs> me. It's like I just asked him to strip naked and dance. Like you basically did. According to his, you know his culture, what's kind of funny about that also in a way is as a first time read, you could just think, well, so maybe Tempe is like damaged, you know, because you don't know. I mean, you are accepting he's kind of a representation of another culture, and it's playing out in that way through the language and everything. So it's sort of in that vein. But you could also still wonder. I mean, I think you have to in some way wonder. This is one single person representing, so they could just be this individual's broken. You know? But it's it's pretty clear once he gets gets there that yes. it is it is not just Tempe. This is no, no, I understand that, know. but I'm just saying, you know, at this point on a, on a first read, it is kind of like you're still on your heels quite a bit. Yeah, you. you know, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily think this is a cultural thing. You would think like what you would think, and I'm sure I thought was that. There, there must be something about Tempe's past that this is is hinting at, like something fucked up about his past, and then Kavoth talking about this brought those dredged up those feelings is what I would have mm-hmm. I imagine is what I was thinking. I wouldn't have yeah. thought like this is just a dim culture. I wouldn't have it's immediately a, it's a, gone there. It, yeah, it's a really interesting thing for it's an interesting position for Roth was to put the reader in. Because you're still and, like kind of getting to know things, but then you're just like, whoa. So like Kavoth already had a couple setbacks trying to communicate with Tempe with the Katan and things or the Lathani, sorry. And then you have this where he's now like, oh, well, what about songs? He's like, oh, absolutely. He's horrid or er, horrid. He's, uh, you know, he's he's absolutely astonished and embarrassed and like his reaction would be crazy. We're like, what the fuck did I say? Like, Jesus, man. <laughs> 
Yeah. And, and you, even as far as like, you know, uh, what you would be thinking, you, you wouldn't be thinking like that. That's how the ADEM view music. Like when you hear how they view music, it's, it's completely outlandish to us. So it's not even an area that we would go to because it is so different from yeah, us. We yeah. wouldn't even uh, guess absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Yeah. The, the, the consideration is, man, this dude either like, his mother was a singer or something, something happened that damaged him forever for people singing songs around him. Like, and which is, again, that's also super, super, uh, you know, specific towards one individual to have that sort of reaction just from a song. But, um, but yeah, to find it out about the culture. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's so opposed to how our culture is. But I mean, it's interesting. It's really interesting to consider, and the, the fact that they even have a, a uh, like a, a proper way to do it with like a a fucking sheet and or whatever. Like they have a uh, something you stand behind. Yeah, or at least like that's how Kavotha. Yeah, I can't remember if like they do that in the the house or whatever. But yeah, it's yeah, that's Kavotha does that for Fichette when uh, he sings for her, or he didn't even sing for her. He just plays music. I think I can't. I can't remember exactly, but yeah, it's like they have a, like there's a proper approach, right? It's like, you got to hide in a, behind a wall and shit. Yeah. It's a, it's a bizarre, bizarre thing because like in, at that point, if you look at, you know, music as like, you know, having, you know, a, a prostitute in your house, like who has like get gathers their family around to watch a prostitute that now, now you've just made that weird. Like now, like, <laughs> It's weirder that you guys view it as prostitution and then you invite prostitutes into your house and you all sit and, and as a family and watch the prostitute do his or her thing. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, that's a weird analogy, right? Yeah. I guess so like no matter right. now the way you guys view music, you've just made listening to music at all super weird unless you're doing it by yourself. Yeah, that's, um, I would imagine, I mean, you would have to, I don't like, I I would think the youth, like, like, it's it's funny, like every generation has their music and the older generations are always like, what the hell is that shit? That is terrible. Like, so with them, it's everything. It would be any type of music, like whistling, (laughs) whistling on a fucking flute would be like, that is, that's outlandish. They, they, they only like one. You know, they they got like one particular genre is like, you know, super taboo. And that's that's the kind of music that Tempe's into. It's like, I like that fucking taboo fucking and fucking country music. It's fucking country music. Fucking, that's yeah, that's super ta- taboo. Be something that people would be like, oh, I'm fucking I'm, I, I just I just want to see some straight fucking missionary position stuff. <laughs> Not that fucking like super gross old, country music. Maybe it's just like super old timey music, you know? Or it's like dee 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 dee. Yeah, it'd be like, like hip hop. Hip hop would be, you know, like some fucking hardcore, hardcore porn, and pop music would be like missionary position porn, and then country music would be that super gross taboo shit. <laughs> <laughs> your your analogy to different types of porn is uh, it's, it's pretty. Hey man, they're the ones that fucking view this shit in the the weird uh, porno sense. I'm just trying to make sense of it and make it sense into our world. Okay. So, uh-huh. I didn't write this book. Fucking talk to Rothfuss. Yeah, it's in the subtext, isn't it? Yeah. It's almost in the fucking explicit text. It's the way they fucking describe it. <laughs> well, actually, yeah. I mean, is it Vachette? It doesn't seem like it's Tempe that explains. No, Vachette explains explain it to him. It. Like, cause, I mean, he's, like he mentions that he plays music or whatever. She's like, dude, shut the fuck up. Don't fucking tell people that. Whoa. They already think they already got a low enough opinion of you. I think there is. Isn't there, though, like... Isn't there like a moment or so where it's either Tempe or somebody else that's in the ADEM like mimics what they do and it's like eyes wide open and like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example that. I don't know, but they, uh, 
like get the with the music like uh Caserette, like you know brought his his uh loot out and put it under the fucking tree that he has to go to oh yeah so like to try to fucking embarrass him or you know shake him up a little bit there that hey we all know that you're fucking a porn star <laughs> well the funny thing is i mean if i remember right i mean Kavoth, you know he does get he does get shamed into I'm uh, an utter savage here and they don't respect me, but he doesn't seem to waffle from, he is still a musician, you know, like I don't he didn't remember talk about his, it. Like he doesn't no, I, talk I, about it. No, I understand that. But in his own mind, he's just like, yeah. These people are fucking weird. Like, I'm, Oh yeah, I'm, for it, sure. There's nothing yeah. to be, there's nothing to be, you know, ashamed of or anything. And I, if I remember right, there's at least the number that, that start to open up to, the skill to a degree. No, he doesn't play music for him. He plays it for Vachette, but that's it. He doesn't play well, music one. for anybody else. He doesn't do a, whole, a concert. He doesn't sell out a show. No, or they all no. stand in the round and watch him whack off. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I saw that Adam Sandler yeah. bit. <laughs> They're all gonna laugh at you. <laughs> Oh, man. But, all right, yeah, and then so we get uh, chapter 81, The Jealous Moon, and in this chapter, Day Dan tells a story of uh, Valerian and pisses off uh, Hespa. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Pretty, pretty funny that he doesn't... <laughs> I mean, he basically... Ah, it's so good because he goes so over the top after she's already clearly annoyed. Yeah. But before we get all the way there. Um, but and, and she starts off by telling like a surprisingly romantic tale of a queen who loved a serving boy. She told her story with a gentle passion. And if her telling didn't show a tender heart, the look she gave Day Dan as she spoke of the queen's love did. Day Dan, however, failed to see the marks of love on her. And with a folly I've rarely seen equaled, he began to tell a story he'd heard at the Penny's Worth Inn, a tale of Flurian. And he said... The the boy who told me this was hardly as old as uh, Kavoth here, and if you'd heard him talk, you'd seen he wasn't the sort who could make who could invent such a tale. Mercy he tapped his temple meaningfully, but listen and judge for yourself if it's worth listening to. And he starts to tell this story, and then the the aspect of the the story that solidifies it um, that it's it's got some truth to it is when he talks about the the words that she uses. Uh -huh. And you know, Florian singing softly and Salanian, like the, the, all the different words that he uses, like there, it's clear that this isn't something that he invented himself. Uh -huh. This is something that she would have came up with. But well, then then he goes as far as even saying that he only heard the words once. Yeah, that he knows them all. Like that's yeah. pretty fucking impressive. Yeah, like yeah, that it sticks stuck in with your head. Him. Like it sticks yeah. in your head like that. Yeah, and, and we find out that's probably it's pretty accurate because it sounds like that's the song she was singing when they come across her. Well, that, that's what I'm saying, and the fact that it sticks in Day Dan's head. This isn't this isn't Denna or Kavoth that's reciting something they just heard. Which yeah, we would in a way we would accept it quite easily with them because of their ear. But Day Dan doesn't. I mean, he's, he's not a complete simpleton, but you know, he's kind of dense. So the idea, and he's also not a musician. So the fact and that he, he explicitly says, listening. like, I wouldn't fucking be able to fucking learn this shit off of one time. Yeah. But yeah. And then so, uh, and I, and I like the aspect of when he starts the story. He's like, this story of Florian, Lady of Twilight, Lady of the First Quiet, Florian, who is death to men, but a glad death and one they go to willingly. Florian, to be asked, death to men. She is, he paused, she is, uh, Sinton. He lifted his hands in front of himself and made a sort of gripping gesture. He eyed us expectantly. Then, seeing we didn't understand, he touched his sword where it laid aside. I understand. No, I said. Uh, she's not one of the A-Dims. Tempe shook his head and, and pointed at Martin's bow. I shook my head. No, she's not a fighter at all. I trailed off, unable to think how I would explain how flaring killed men, especially if I were forced to resort to gestures. Desperate, I looked to Dave Dan for help. Sex, he said. Uh, do you know sex? I love the fact Tempe like fucking starts busting out laughing. It's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know sex. <laughs> yeah, he throws his head back and laughs. Yeah. 
And he's just like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's like, yeah, dude, yeah, you, you don't sucks. understand. That's like sex is like breathing for us, man. Yeah, that's kind of our thing. Yeah. Like if we're fighting and, and get a fucking stiffy, we just like we take a break and bang one out. That's just what yeah. we do. Like, like it's there's nothing to it. And then, yeah, Day Dan's like, that's how she kills man. And for for a moment, Tempe looked more blank than usual. Then a slow horror spread across his face. No, not horror. It was raw disgust and revulsion, made all the worse by the fact that his face was usually so blank. His hands clenched in several unfamiliar gestures at his side. How? He choked out the word. Has Because uh, I like that aspect because, you know, it's he's thinking like it's probably some STD or something. Because of how <laughs> disgusted they are, you yeah. know, with STDs. But yeah, and then Hespi, you know, points to her chest and is like, you know, mimicking like her heart beating faster and faster and having a heart attack. Yeah, that's pretty good. That uh, and it gets it across because then he understands it. I, I did have a question, though, um, when they talk about the superstitions of the, the Fae world. Um, there was something that kind of I didn't. It just jumped out at me where they talks about cloven hoofed pucks that dance when the moon's full, dark things with long fingers that steal babes from cribs. Minnie's the woman, old wife or new, who leaves out bread and milk at night. And Minnie's the man who makes well sure he builds his house with all his doors in a row. I'd never, that doors in a row, building a house with all the doors in a row seemed, I don't know, odd to me. Like it's suggesting something. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um, what the significance would be and as far as you know your doors built in a row or what the context would mean but obviously they have some superstition about how either houses are built or how doors are built or where they're positioned or something along those lines but i don't know what the significance of it would be just off of that i was wondering i'd come across it and it kind of stuck out to me but uh, yeah, there's just not enough yeah. context there to to guess at if there's any kind of accuracy to it because we know like getting in in the fay, it's they're not coming through your doors; they're coming through um, the waystones, the graystones. Is how they're getting in and out. But I mean, there it could there could be aspects to like keeping them out, like we talked about with in in the the prologue, Kavo, the locks to the the waystone in are made out of copper mm -hmm. and things along those lines. And it seems like the, the chimney is built through a waystone, like the, the middle of the, the building is, is a big gray stone. So mm -hmm. there could be aspects to how to prevent a Fay from getting inside or trapping them, you know, inside or those kind of things. But uh, without more context, I don't know. Yeah. It almost makes me think of like portal. You know, you open one door, and if it's in line with another door, you can keep falling through almost infinitely. So if they're in a row, then you wouldn't be able to just fall through. Yeah. yeah. Could uh, be. I don't know. But yeah, there's not enough context to it to to figure out what they mean by that. The The other thing I was going to mention about the song is when he does start singing, or when he does sing the song, it actually sends shivers through Kavoth as well. Yeah. So there's definitely some power in the song, in Flurian songs, and the fact that even being sung by others, um, it still carries that that uh, significance is pretty telling. There, and again, this speaks to what we've talked about with Kavoth's innate sort of magical ability within music, within song. And I think, yeah, it's something that we can see here with uh, Florian. And this... The way the chapter ends is fucking great because he's like, you know, I've always enjoyed stories of, about Florian, but as I glanced at Hespa, my anticipation cooled. She was watching Day Dan, and as he spoke, her eyes narrowed. Day Dan failed to see this. She was tall with long, graceful legs. Her waist was slender. Her hips curved as if begging for a touch of a hand. Her stomach was perfect and smooth, like a flawless piece of birch, birch bark. Uh, with the and the dimple of her navel seemed uh, made for kissing. Hespa's eyes were dangerous slits by this point, but even more telling was her mouth, which had formed a thin, straight line. A word of advice to you: Should you ever see the look on a woman's face, leave off talking at once and sit on both your hands. It may not mend matters, but at least it will keep you from making making the many worse. Yeah, definitely don't want to talk about like how fucking 
hot some other girl is in front of a girl that likes you. It kind of, you know what actually kind of jumped out at me when she tells the romantic story mm-hmm. and Dan, Dan launches into, hey, this this chick, dude, oh man, she's so hot, and starts talking. About it. Yeah, it kind of kind of reminds me of Kavoth, what we talked about before when he meets up with Denna and she and he's like, uh, so how are those dudes doing? Yeah, any, any new guys? Any new guys in your life? We talking about some dudes. Kind of remind yeah. me of that. No yeah, way. like this is except, way over the top, worse, but <laughs> this is yeah, this is more obliviousness <laughs> and not <laughs> the, just the, the, like making a making a you know a stupid weak move. Well, what's even with the the coup de gras for me is like he his <laughs> his hands up, her breasts were full and round like peaches waiting to be taken from the tree. Even the jealous moon, which steals the color from all things, couldn't hide the rosy. And cut off by Hespy, made a disgusted noise and pushed herself to her feet. I'll just leave then, she said. Her voice held such chill, even Daydan couldn't miss it. And uh, he's like, what? He looks up at her, and his hands are still yeah. in front of yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Still Cupping. cupping the uh, <laughs> imagined pair of breasts. It's such a funny image yeah. of just absolute cluelessness. Like, he's, what? He's sitting there doing the, the fucking tune in in Tokyo fucking thing. <laughs> an idiot that so fucking great. great like she's telling this romantic story and looking at him all doughy eyed and this you know tale of these two two lovers coming together and he's like he's like so it's fucking this hot piece of fucking ass man she had these <laughs> perfect titties man <laughs> oh man it's fucking jackass but yeah and then both, you know, did it end with uh, both brothers chasing after her and the boy's father falling behind? I asked uh, Dad and looked back. Uh, You've already heard it then? You could have stopped me if you didn't. I'm, I'm just guessing, I said quickly. I hate not hearing the end of a story. Father put his foot in a rabbit hole, Dad and said shortly. Sprained his ankle. Nobody saw the uncle again. Stalked out of the circle of firelight, expression grim. And then, uh, you know, they and they go to bed from there. And, uh, but then it finishes with, um, as attractive as some things are, you have to weigh your risks. How badly do you want it? How badly are you willing to be burned? Spread the fire and soon the dark of night settled into the clearing. I lay on my back, looked at the stars and thought of dinner, which that is, um, a warning that he, he should have, uh, taken to, to heart in his own life. It's like, yep. you know. As attractive as going after the Chandrian are, getting your revenge, as appealing as that sounds to you, you know, are you willing to, you know, do, uh, the consequences, are they worth it? Obviously, I think if you asked him now in the bar, he would have said no, the, 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 the consequences were not worth it. Yeah. Yeah, I think for sure. Obviously, we don't know what the consequences in particular are, but it seems uh, pretty rough. Yeah. I, like I I think he would if he could change mad. go back and change things he would he would not go down the path that he went down. He doesn't seem to be like fucking super stoked about the decisions <laughs> he made. No, he doesn't seem super stoked to be coat. Seems a little uh, a little depressed about it. But uh, yeah, that's a good. I mean, it's a great question coming from Martin, bringing the question up. And the way that I I thought of it initially also was kind of was with Denna, was the question of, you know, you have to weigh your risk. How badly do you want it? How badly are you willing to be burned? That's the risk that he was not willing to take in shooting his shot with her, right? Because he's afraid he would get burned. He's afraid he would lose his relationship with her, his friendship with her, if he made some move, which she told him repeatedly to do. Yeah. He's oblivious. He's as oblivious as uh, Day Dan in, in Day his Dan own unique his... way, though. He's Day Dan holding up his fake boobs. Yeah, so, his imaginary, imaginary boobs. Except for he's not making, he's not really making Dinah jealous. Not at least at this point. He's more coming off as the ever available but not interested guy. Yeah, I mean, I guess there was a point, there was a moment where there could have been jealousy when she saw saw fella give him the cloak. Yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, he just yeah, the oblivious the obliviousness I would have to imagine in Denna's eyes reads as disinterested. Yeah, yeah, that's what you would think. Like he's just only sees her as a friend. 
Which, in her eyes, you would have to imagine, makes it makes her feel like, well, I'm not good enough for him. Yeah. Yeah, they it's both kind of... Kinda, it seems like they both kind of feel that way towards the other. And neither of them are t- yeah. intending to do that. Jesus. That is fucking brutal. But that's, uh, again, testament to Rothfuss. Uh, but then we got uh, chapter 82. It's titled Barbarians. And in this chapter... Kvothe realizes that the fidgeting is actually the way that they ADEM express themselves. And so Tempe begins to teach him hand talk. Awesome. I think it's, I think it's so great the way this like develops and how Kvothe slowly starts to realize it. And then the excitement with which he has to be able to sort of fit. Cause then he starts to reel back and just like, realizes everything he's been witnessing and it all sort of just fits in and clicks in as like oh shit like so many things start to make sense once he comes to the realization yeah because it even starts off with you know again his blank expression and refusal to make eye contact were the main problems how could i make intelligent conversation with a person i had no idea how he felt it was like trying to walk blindfolded through an unfamiliar house so it kind of sets up the chapter with, you know, explaining how difficult it is to talk to someone who you can't read their expressions. And then, well, you, and then he, you learn, OK, this is what's going on. There's something different. Well, and then it even goes as far as I had offended him by asking about the Lathani early on. So I knew to avoid the subject. But if he was upset by a single question about singing, how could I begin to guess what might offend him? That's what I was saying before, where it's like now he's like, well. What yeah? What's taboo with this guy? You know, other than apparently playing country music. Yeah, um, don't don't play country music. That shit's super dirty. Well, I thought I thought you said that was his thing. He's only into the most the most taboo. Yeah, well, don't do it in front of people. Like, get yourself. Oh, like, make he sure needs you're, to be alone. Yeah, you don't want to be doing it like yeah, in he probably the group. doesn't. He doesn't want Kavoth around either. He wants him to hand him a mixtape that he yeah, at least he better be behind himself. like a curtain. Like he's. They can't be making eye contact with fucking Tempe while he's watching his hardcore <laughs> taboo porn. I'm picturing like he has a boom box, hits play, and just stares into his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's so weird. Put on some uh, Garth Brooks and stare at each other's ugh. in the eye. That's an awful. See, he's dirty. So fucking, yeah. that's what Tempe likes, but he doesn't want the fucking his friends to watch him while he listens to Garth Brooks. Yeah, I can see that. I can see him being embarrassed. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. Uh, but yeah, and then um, so I, I like too that you know through them practicing the language, I like how he kind of manipulates Tempe, where he's like, you know, best of all, Tempe got to practice his a turn while I build up my academic vocabulary. He noticed the more mistakes I made in his language, the more comfortable he grew in his own attempts at expressing himself. This meant, of course, that I made many mistakes. In fact, I was occasionally so thick-headed that Tempe was forced to explain himself several times in several different ways, all in, all in a turn, of course. He's obviously he's just doing that on purpose and manipulating him to help him learn the language. And, and Kvothe is always about that. Like He doesn't just come out and if if he can manipulate someone into learning something uh he'll do that versus explaining it so that they understand why he's he's doing what he's doing yeah i mean does that remind you of abanthi like didn't abanthi do something similar like he'd make him move yeah a couple the, times the maybe process. like in like you know the pine tar or pine pitch or whatever that's you know it's 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 not something that you necessarily need it's more of a manipulative um thing instead of explaining exactly how it would work it's more manipulative well i think it's in in a way it's again one of those examples that i've seen a number of times that kvothe could be like a really good teacher in the sense that it's manipulative but it's manipulative in a positive way that can actually be of help you know and that's it doesn't look like to the individual he's being manipulated that's kind of important, especially in a yeah. teaching aspect. Then, it, and it, it sounds like, um, you know, after that, because like Tempe goes and gets washed up and then just comes walking back up butt naked. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which 
you know, speaking of like, you know, how uncomfortable it'd be to stare at each other listening to Garth Brooks, like <laughs> fucking dude just comes up walking where you're like fucking chilling, sitting on the ground, comes walking up with his fucking shit hanging, hanging loose, like walking straight up to you. Like, hey, what is this tick? Like, dude, get your fucking <laughs> dick out of my face. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, that's pretty funny. Like, yeah, literally like, hey, what, what is this? I don't like this. What is yeah. this? Like, what the, f- dude? But yeah, it is It is pretty funny because Kavoth, even in himself, is like, it took all his stage training to not like, to, I don't know, freak out or whatever, to have yeah. a reaction. You know, the, the reaction that you want to have when you see that you're like, what the, what the hell? He's over there making momets and this yeah. dude walks up, you know, butt naked. <laughs> It's pretty wild, man. Yeah. And then, so, yeah, explains what ticks are to him. And then I, I like, too, that, you know, Tempe, after that, he, he goes back to, you know, he's like, it, it bites on me. Bites and stays. The expression was uh, blank as always, but his tone was tinged with disgust. His left hand fidgeted. There are no ticks in uh, a dim ray? No. He made a point of trying to pinch it between his fingers. It did not break. And so he teaches him how to fucking kill it. But then, like... Tempe goes back to his bedroll and, you know, instead of like getting dressed now, he's like going through shaking everything out. So he's staying there butt naked, <laughs> shaking his body around, like flipping and flopping everywhere. Yeah. He's doing his laundry, butt naked. <laughs> yeah. It's like basically like might as well like be like swinging back and forth and just like flapping his shit around. Well, I love I, uh, then at what he also mentions is like, I kept my eyes averted knowing deep down in my heart, this is going to be the exact moment that yeah. Jay Dan and Hespi return. Yeah. This is, as soon as they, they're going to walk in, I'm standing here like, Whoa, like trying Mind, to look at nothing. Reminds me of that like Seinfeld where like the, he starts dating the girl that wants to walk around naked all the time and he thinks yeah. it's going to be awesome at first. And then he realizes like, you know, how many things like she does that it's ugly to see her naked in like when yeah. she's opening the bottle and shit and she's like straining <laughs> to open it and he's like oh gross <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah there's like certain things where you see uh muscles that don't get used very often yeah. being tensed and it's like wow i need to see all this what the hell man yeah but so i like his his move is he starts walking around naked and she's like no gross yeah yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? I thought this was good. No, this is, this is gross. Okay, well, I guess we're going to stop this. And then, yeah, so, um, you know, shirtless, he walked back to where I sat. I hate Tick, he declared. Uh, when he spoke, he le- his left hand made a uh, sharp gesture as if he was brushing crumbs off the front of his shirt near his hip, except he wasn't wearing a shirt, and there was nothing on his uh, bare skin to brush away. What's more, I'd realized he made the same gesture earlier. In fact, now that I thought of it, I'd seen him make that gesture a half dozen times in the last several days, uh, though never so violently. I had a sudden suspicion. Tempe, what does that mean? Uh, I mimicked the brushing away gesture. He nodded. It is this. He scrunched his face up in an exaggerated expression of disgust. My mind went spinning back over the last span of days, thinking of how many times I've seen Tempe fidgeting restlessly while we talk. I reeled at the thought of it. Tempe, I asked, is all of this? I made a gesture to my face, then smiled, frowned, rolled my eyes. Does all this happen with hands in Ademic? He nodded. Uh, he made a gesture at the same time. That, I pointed at his hand. What is that? He hesitated, then gave a forced, awkward-looking smile. I copied the gesture, splaying my hand slightly and pressing my thumb to the side of the middle finger. No, he said. Other hand, left. Why? He reached out and thumped uh, my chest just left of the breastbone. Thump, 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 thump. Then he ran down to the finger to my left hand. I nodded to show I understood. It was close to the heart. He held up his right hand and made a fist. This hand is strong. He held up his left. This hand is clever. So, massive re- revelation at this point, like mm. when you're going through the first time that, oh, so he's not fidgeting. He, these are him expressing himself. These are him making his, making faces, explaining disgust, anger, you know, uh, you know, happiness, you know, all the, all these type of emotions that he's been feeling the whole time. He's just been expressing them with his hands. You know, there's a couple of things that could kind of make me question. So, like, there's certain things that the ADEM are secretive about. It doesn't seem like this is something they're secretive about. Yeah. Right? Just communication of their language. So, I wonder if it was a different ADEM 
than Tempe, would he have been able to communicate this to someone else? Because we've come to find out Tempe's kind of a simpleton for them and their world and their culture. Yeah, I mean, I, I you you would have a thought like he would have brought it up, but I guess if no one's asking him, you know, like because it, it, it would it's a question that you wouldn't ask someone because it would come off as yeah. rude. Like, why don't you fucking make facial expressions or or shit like that? Like, why are you fucking stone faced all the yeah, time? It, it, like, yeah, people it just don't like, typically ask that. It seems like most others, yeah, Cavo's a little different in that he will pry. And he Although occasionally you do run into the fucking the douche like, hey, smile. And yeah, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can smile. I love getting that. Oh, God. That is, that is my, like, girls talk about that. Like, they, like oh, I hate when guys do that. It's like, oh, no, they do that to me, too. It's not a, that's not a, uh, a specific thing with girls. That they, they, like, my face is normally... You know, I, I'm not like walking around with a big smile on my face all the time. My face is usually rather blank. And, you know, when I'm just walking around and um, and, and so I constantly get that or like or what's wrong. I get that. I would get oh, that a lot, a too, one. where it's like nothing. Nothing was wrong. But now I'm kind of annoyed. Yes, yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a, that's it's a, a stupid one. fucking question. There's a couple jobs I've had where. uh I've been told after a while, like, oh, I heard you're the angry one. Like, what? what is it? Like, I, if for a week or two weeks of just not talking to anyone yet, I'm the angry one. Yeah. And it's just my, my normal face looks like I guess I'm annoyed or I'm pissed off or something. It's just, you know what it is. I'm just busy. Yeah. And if you look, you know, annoyed, everybody thinks you're busy. But apparently, if you look busy, then everybody thinks you're annoyed, at least in my case. Yeah. But yeah, there's nothing quite like that moment of, uh, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's 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 what, what's going on? Man, nothing. Fuck. <laughs> uh, it's 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 so annoying. And it it would be it wouldn't be annoying if it happened once, you know, but it, when when you hear it your whole fucking life and then it starts getting annoying every time someone asks it and then it's like dude shut the fuck up man like do i ask you why you got that stupid smile on your face <laughs> when somebody so i guess if it happens so much to you eventually at some point you just have to say, when someone says what's wrong you have to say i am eternally unhappy yeah i this my, is just what it looks like i bought a hundred dogs all a day apart, and they've been dying one a day. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Are they timed out? Yeah. They're that close? They, they're they all dying on their 15th birthday, and they're all born one day before the other one, so. You're just going through a lot right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. Is that I have so many dogs that are aged very closely, but all like a day apart, so they're all dying one by one every single day. So See the, that's the why key, my face looks like this. The key is you you deliver that, but you deliver that with like a smile. Mm -hmm. That will make people really confused. Yeah. No, my dogs are dead. <laughs> just, just, big just, fucking grin on your face. They just keep dying. They yeah. keep dying. Like <laughs> you don't look upset about it all of a sudden. Well, I was earlier, but now that you bring it up, I like to I'm really talk about, about it, it though. <laughs> I don't like to think about it, but I love to talk about it. So thank you. So uh, but yeah, so then, so he starts learning the hand gestures for him. The, I learned that a dimmick hand gestures did not actually represent facial expressions. It was nothing so simple as that. For example, a smile can mean you're amused, happy, grateful, or satisfied. You can smile to comfort someone. You can smile because you're content or because you're in love. A grimace or a grin looks similar to a smile, but they mean entirely different things. And imagine trying to teach someone how to smile. Imagine trying to describe what a different smiles mean and when precisely to use them in conversation. It's harder than learning to walk. Suddenly, so many things made sense. Of course, Tempe wouldn't look me in the eyes. There was nothing to be gained by looking at someone uh, at, at, at the face of, of the person you were talking to. You listen to the voice, but you watch the hand. Hmm. So he learns, starts learning different expressions with them, but you know, it's obviously extremely difficult. And so, but, um, 
you know, ha- have you tried to pantomime compliance, respect, sarcasm? I doubt even my father could have accomplished such a thing because of this process progress uh because of this my progress was frustratingly slow but i couldn't help but be fascinated it was like suddenly being given a second tongue and it was a secret thing of sorts i had always i had a weakness for secrets and he yeah. do, he doesn't realize like the more he learns about their culture the you know more precarious a position he's putting tempe in because a lot of their aspects of their culture you're not supposed to fucking talk about yeah i definitely yeah there's no awareness of any of that i remember I feel like I remember reading this the first time and getting like pretty excited because it's it's so it, it it's so much unfolding a new complexity to the, to the world that you didn't see coming. You know, it makes so many things that were just laid out make sense now about Tempe and how he why is he always fidgeting? Why is he like grabbing his collar? Like all these things now all the all of that starts to make sense. But I remember in reading that it's like, oh man, this is like it's just it's really interesting to be able to to go into this world with a whole different type of language that's not exactly sign language you know there's there's a lot of nuance with it that ties in with the face and the hand and the way of standing and all these other things it's pretty cool yeah yeah and so he he asks and I like the aspect where he asks him like why do you do all this it seems like you know making facial expressions would be so much easier and he's like, well, that's uncivilized. He's like, yeah, he, just something being easier doesn't mean, or natural doesn't mean, you know, it, it's civilized. It's like, you know, well, what what is the word for good living together? Nobody shits in the well. I laugh, civilization. <laughs> he nodded, explain his fingers, amusement. Yes, he said, speaking with hands of civilization. But smiling is natural, I protested. Everyone smiles. Natural is not civilization. Cooking meat is civilization. Washing off the stink is civilization. Uh, so in a dim ray, you always smile with hands. I wish I knew the gesture for dismay. No, smiling with face, uh, good with family, good with some friend. Uh, with only family, Tempe uh, repeated his thumbs on collarbone gesture again. When you make uh, this, he pressed his palm to the side of his face and blew air into it, making a flatulent noise. That is natural, but you do not make it near others. Rude. With family, he shrugged amusement. Civilization not important, more natural with family. Like that's his so, example. He's like, look, you you're not gonna fart in the face of a stranger, but if you fart in your brother's face, that shit's hilarious. I was gonna that's say, the fart I love, game. I love that he I love that he says amusement. Yeah. That's funny. Because it, it was funny the first time and it'll be yeah. funny the last time too. It reminds me of that Ed, Eddie Murphy bit where he talks about like uh Oh, tub? that's the that's the fart game. You know, like it's, it's like, ah, oh, you fired in my mouth. <laughs> Got me good. Such a Jesus. fucking hilarious bit talking about farting in front of your family and shit. The, um, yeah, I love the, I love the, what is the word for good together living? Nobody shits in the well. It's yeah. such a great, uh, great, yeah, it's civilization. It makes sense. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, I, I lo- love that too. Like the, so you're getting you're getting this whole the formality right of civilization it, the, the and the the formality of how they look at the world differently and what is foremost to be proper and the proper is to use your hands to communicate at home yeah it's fine to go ahead and joke around and laugh and smile and all that but that's just with family so there's the real real serious uh, formality in their world and quite- you you get another one of their their culture or things here where he's like, what about laughing? I asked, uh, I've seen you laugh. I made a ha ha sound. So he knew what I was talking about. He shrugged laughing is that's another one of those, you know, the fewer words, the better where he just stops the sentence there and we both like waits for him to finish. He's mm-hmm. like, Oh, laughing is okay. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> and uh, so Tempe explains like, you know, laughing comes from your stomach. And so you got, you don't want to hold that stuff in. Same with crying. It's like that, uh, same place, not healthy to push down. Yeah. That makes, uh, I, that, that also does make a lot of sense in the sense that, yeah, Ain't- one's from the stomach, one's from the heart, one ties in with everything else. But I mean, and it makes a lot of sense too, that it's, it's healthy to allow those things, things out. Right. And that shows true. I would say even even in our world um it's unrealistic too like i mean 
like go to imagine go to a comedy show and instead of like actually laughing just trying to make a hand sign that shows you you thought it was funny well, you're not gonna be able to do it you're gonna fucking laugh but what that does also tell us is that uptight people are hurting themselves yeah they're literally hurting themselves but then also in line with hurting yourself it doesn't matter how culturally appropriate it would be for for me personally to cry in front of people i won't do it you push it down with everything you have you never allow it to happen ever not a big That's crier weird. so like it doesn't i it never is. really have to push it down no you always do no matter what all those dogs yeah <laughs> wow that's all those I, dogs yeah that's painful to think about but as long as i'm talking about it then it's hilarious <laughs> it doesn't make any sense at all <laughs> you know it's it's civilization you, you oh don't okay understand. you're like shitting in the woods and and stuff like i'm i'm civilized I was actually just thinking as well, what would be really funny is if when he did a fake laugh, he accidentally farted. It would have really yeah. confused Tim. Yeah. It's like, wait, so what are we talking about here? <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, hold on. I didn't mean that. No. Just yeah. Kathy today. <laughs> I like, I like to like, uh, cause Kavoth, you know, asked him, it's like, so it must be hard for you out here. And, uh, um, you know, he's like, I nodded slowly trying to imagine what it must be like for Tempe constantly insulted by people too rude to keep their expressions to themselves. People whose hands constantly made gestures that were nonsense. It's like, not so hard understatement. Uh, when I leave a dim ray, I know this, not civilization. Barbarians are rude. Barbarians. He made a wide gesture encompassing our clearing the forest, all of Ventus. Everyone here like dogs. He made a grotesquely exaggerated expression of rage, showing all his teeth, snarling, rolling his eyes madly. <laughs> that is all you know. He shrugged nonchalant acceptance as if uh, to say he didn't hold it against us. I love that. Like, you guys are just like fucking dogs, man. It's no no big deal. I know what I'm getting into. I, I like dogs. Dogs are all right. <laughs> well, I, I love it especially when he makes that image. Grotesquely uh, exaggerated expression of rage. Showing all your teeth, snarling and rolling your eyes madly. Yeah. Yeah, that's just normal for you guys. That's what yeah. you look like. Yeah. All the time. You guys are just <laughs> stupid pieces of shit, man. <laughs> I'm used to it. You yeah. guys are just complete jackasses. You guys just take. Fine. You guys, you know, you take dumps and you, know, you you upper deck yourself. You take dumps on your plate. <laughs> it's just what you guys do. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. Is it dumps on your I don't plate. Hold it, yeah, I don't hold it against you. <laughs> I, I do also like the, well, what of children? Children smile before they talk. Is that wrong? He's like, all children are barbarians. <laughs> He's like, yeah. 100%. All children yeah. are rude. 100%. Yeah. That's true in our world as well. But they go old, they watch, they learn. Yeah, and, yeah. And I like barbarians have no women to teach them civilization. Barbarians cannot learn. And that doesn't make any sense on his face until you realize he's he's not just talking about women. He's talking about a dim women that know the Lathani and know their, you know, their fucking teachings. It's like, without that, you cannot be civil civilized. If you don't understand the Lathani, you can't be civilized. And if there's not a woman to teach you the Lathani, then, you know, there's no hope for you. You're shit out of luck. What's it? What's I, I, my, I have to assume that there's a lot of people that read this and they're immediately turned off. You know what I'm Why? saying? That they, barbarians have no woman to teach them civilization. And if they don't continue to read or accept that this is part of the story, they say, well, why do, barbar why, why do women have to teach? Oh. Like, it's their role. I've heard that critique. Well, I've heard the critique that the book is all about sex, which, <laughs> how much sex have we talked about? I mean, yeah. well, okay, this episode we did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, we talked about a lot of porn and shit. And <laughs> It's like yeah. the one time that this is a terrible example. Yeah. <laughs> this episode. <laughs> but altogether in this uh in this book we have not Yeah, I mean yeah, we're we're over 50% through we're like 55% through this book and we had the whole first book and he's still not had any sex at all. So like for the idea that there's just a ton of sex in these books is is it's not accurate. I mean, there are times where there is sex, but it is not prevalent. It's not like he's just, you know, thumping away every chapter in, in the ADEM or even with Valerian. 
he no, does have sex in the book, but it's not like every fucking chapter that in in these parts. It's just some of the chapters that comes up. Yeah, I mean, just basically with Valorian and right after, there's a little bit, and it's not. It's not it's even not graphic. Even, like no, now, yeah, exactly. You read something like a Song of Ice and Fire, and there's some graphic shit in there. Yeah. So if you're offended True. by that, you know, sex and books, man, there's there's trust me, there's some much more graphic books out there. Read like Joe Abercrombie. He's much more graphic with his sex scenes. Well, and and also, man, I mean, that's part of humanity. Yeah, it's part of yeah, what we, we engage. We all in, so. we all do it. So, like, it's well, a little we weird when you like. I mean, humanity. I guess if you're you're writing to a younger audience, like, and, and if you don't want to include that stuff, I don't have a problem with it. I'm just not going to get fucking worked up if there's there's sex in a book like like i'm gonna pretend that that's not a part of human existence well mo- most of the best books i have read include it it's not it's not necessarily i don't read a lot of romance novels so it's not dominant but it's still an element that's within in a lot of books that i've read and a lot of a lot of ya books i mean it's still prevalent because it's a big part of youth yeah and so, I mean, your hormones are out of, out of control yeah. So it should be included. It's it's a big, big part of your experience. So, yeah, I I don't know. I I mean, it. Yeah, I guess. I don't. I don't, I, I don't really care books, either. You know? Yeah, either way. I don't. If there's a book that doesn't cover it, I don't care. And if they do cover it, I, it it doesn't bother me either. Well, like, I, I don't, I mean, I don't get only, why people get worked up over it. Well, I only I only mainly point out this point in particular because you you brought it up that you don't really know here the context, the full on context of why he's saying women because women dominate their world. They're the influencers. They're the teachers in that world. They're hugely dominant in that world, which lends them more power. So I think this line can be taken to mean the opposite of what it actually means, because in their world, there's so much more significance. They're so much more powerful. You know, in in many many different ways, yeah. which we already really talked about in terms of of that part of the world. So, uh, but yeah, and then so Tippy stands up and he begin begins limbering up with a number of stretches, and then he starts practicing his uh, K ten, and then you know Tempe after that, with uh, t- still nettled by Tempe's barbarians cannot learn comment, I decided I would follow along. After all, I didn't have anything better to do. As I tried to mimic him, I became aware of how devilishly complex it was, keeping the hands cupped just so, the feet correctly positioned. Despite the fact that Tempe moved uh, with almost glacial slowness, I found it impossible to imitate his uh, smooth grace. Tempe never paused or looked in my direction. He never even offered a word of encouragement or advice. And obviously, we know... Because teaching the Katan and teaching the uh, you know the Lothani and these things, it, this is not stuff he's he's uh, supposed to teach. Mm-hmm. Not not only you're not supposed to teach barbarians, but Tempe specifically, they're like, no, you're not qualified to fucking teach anybody anything. If I remember right, does he finally start teaching him once they make the deal about he'll teach him music to how to play the lute? Uh, no, like that, that comes later. Um, I, ca- but I was trying to remember if they made the deal first or if it comes, he, it he comes eventually after. like, um, he starts teaching him about the Lothani, like after the, the scene at the bar with the fight, like, and Kvothe like pulls out his knife. So then he starts telling him about the Lothani and then after, you know, as they're becoming oh, yeah. better friends, he see, you know, he gets annoyed with, uh, Kvothe, And so he like corrects a couple of his things. But then eventually, yeah, Kvothe asked him to teach him it. That's right. Because that's a huge, that's, I mean, that's a big part of the tension and turmoil that occurs when they're in a Demre. Because that's the whole like, reason he has to go. It's because Tempe starts oh, yeah, teaching him. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's and right. So, yeah, and then um, it's like wordlessly, Tempe brought out a hard sausage and several potatoes that he began to peel. Uh, Carefully using his sword, I was surprised by this as Tempe fussed over his sword uh, much the same way I did with my loot. Once when Daydan had picked it up, Daydan had responded with a uh, rather dramatic emotional outburst. Dramatic for Tempe, that is. He spoke in two full sentences and frowned a bit. 
And so Kavoth asked about that. I like that. He, and Tempe's just like, yeah, it's fucking sharp and it's clean. It's like, yeah, cut shit with it. What are you talking about? He, yeah. And Tempe looks at his sword as a tool. It's not a killing machine. Kavoth looks at it as a killing machine, which ends up getting his ass whooped um, when he brings that philosophy to Vachette. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, yeah, why do we carry a sword? And he's like, to fucking use it. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> It's like, does we got fucking hands to fucking beat your fucking brains out with? Yeah, it's, it is, it is, again, it's a cultural difference, right? I mean, the yeah. way that, the way that he sees it, it's like, why would you use it for all those things? You're like, why wouldn't I use it for all those things? What I need, I need a knife. I need a different, different sharp thing to do these things. Plus, he doesn't also know that their swords, you know, that it's not just like, uh, it's the blade that holds its sharpness forever, but then will break ramps and steel. It's not just like ramps and steel last thousands of years. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, they, they just don't, they don't view themselves as killing machines. I mean, even though they hire themselves out as mercenaries, they, they, they're not someone who's just going to do something that they think is evil just for money. Yeah. They have, yeah, that's you know, right. they, they have uh, that Lothani and they got their code and, and, they don't they're they're not looking at their sword as like I, I use this to kill. They're the sword is you know, that is something you can use it for, but only if it adheres to what the Lafani fucking suggests. So that's not its purpose. You know. Oh yes. There's all the questions of is of the Lathani, is that of the Lathani, is this? Oh yeah, man, the whole that reminds me of so much where he tips his mind into spinning leaf. Yeah. And just blurts out answers and does a lot of what you were just ins- you were just talking about with his uh, Tempe's sort of uh, poet speech, you know, where it's just like three word sentences or what have you, where it's just extraordinarily meaningful in a short statement. And Kavos has a special knack for that. That's kind of I mean, isn't that that's a big part of what really moves him up in that world more than anything else, because he never really becomes a great fighter in their eyes. No, he, he becomes uh somewhat proficient like just you know where he's good enough where he can draw go even with uh like a 12 year old girl yeah child, like 50 man. 50 but yeah he doesn't he doesn't become like he's he doesn't even get to the point where he's, he's as good as tempe but but with his one word answers or short word answers and the 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 tree he kind of blows off the nips if i remember oh that. yeah yeah he's he he's he, I can't remember what he says about the Lathani, but the way he describes it, yeah, one of one of his answers blew some nips off for for sure. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, then he impresses Fichette by bringing her a giant fucking branch and calling her bluff on uh, as far as her wow. beating him. Yeah, that's right. That's cool. We're gonna get in all this stuff, man. I'm looking forward to it. That's great. And we're skipping over some massive yeah. things too. Yeah, that's that's again, that's a big testament to the book, man. Is and that's again like why I think book two is so freaking strong because some of the most meaningful and memorable things are going to come between what we just talked about in this episode and what we were just leading to with uh, the Adem, the Lathani, and all that. There's still huge things in between that. Yeah, because I, I don't remember what we'll come across next week. I mean, we'll. It'll be more of this. I don't think we'll get to the bandit camp, but we'll probably get to Tempe fighting in the bar. And um, like the first we get, we lesson get a, of the Lithani. We get one or two important stories, right? Yeah, we could be getting like Jax. We, yeah, we could get the at least the first half of the Jax and uh, the Moon story and maybe Tempe at the bar. But like that kind of stuff we're going to get first before... We get into the bandit camp, so uh, it'll probably not be next next week that we get it to the bandits. Uh, probably be two weeks before we get to the bandits, but that's the stuff we got coming up. Right on. Oh yeah, it looks like we have an interlude too. It's been a while, so yeah. Right on. Yeah, and might be uh like a country music porn break, you know. And- <laughs> Is this Coates thing? Or is yeah. that just Yeah, yeah. Co- Coates adopts that where that's why he doesn't play music anymore in the bar because it's so pornographic to him. 
Okay. That's taking like, a weird oof, turn. You think I'm going to fucking just like fucking whip it out and fucking get naked in front of you guys? I'm not some fucking barbarian. I don't fucking play music in front of people. Fucking so, sick perverts. So he was in the Adem for enough of a period that he adopted yeah. the, their cultural uh, tabooed feelings as well. Yeah. Yeah. Chronicler is Chronicler is going to ask him to play a song and he's going to be like you fucking pervert. I knew you were a sick freak. I, I could just him tell. That. I could I saw it in your face. You're a fucking freak. I could definitely see him do, doing that to Chronicler. Chronicler gets the he he gets that sort of treatment from people a little bit from their group. It's like I just wanted to hear, you know, fucking the lay of Sir Sabian trailer yard. Oh yeah, the lay of Sir Sabian trailer yard. Yeah, okay, you freak. Jesus. Okay. Well, that's weird. Like, so it, just if I ask you something, what would be great is if somebody else comes in and they're like, hey, I'm going to play, uh, you know, what's the one? Uh, Aunt Betty by the Creek yeah. or some shit. One, of, like, yeah. one of the girl. It, it's like any, anytime one of the guys asks him, he gets super offended. But when some hot yeah. girl comes in, he's like yeah. fucking pulling out his loot and doing a <laughs> fucking jig. <laughs> Stands on the bar, yeah. starts performing for everybody. Chronicle's like, man, this dude's a dick. Dancing Jake, dick. kicking over everybody's cups and shit as he goes. <laughs> Actually, you know, it'd be great. And he's the song he decides to sing, he writes a song about the Chronicler. Remember yeah. That he made the whole thing, yeah. Bast made up the whole thing about. Oh, have you heard the tale <laughs> of the great Chronicler? Just like, God, this fucking dude. He's just so trolling him right in front Rothfuss of him. Rothfuss will, will completely, like, with all the expectations people have for book three, and, like, so why doesn't he play music? And then Rothfuss is going to write in that he just starts playing music and fucking dancing a jig and stuff and doing sympathy and all this shit. And then it's just going to be like, yeah, there was nothing to any of that. <laughs> he's at, he's always had his powers. Like, he's in, in like, Coat versus Kavoth, there's nothing. He's He's... He just calls himself Coat, but he's still Kavoth. Still has all his powers, still all his abilities. That would really, really twist my nips. Yeah, yeah. In a negative way, not There's a good not, way. It's nothing to any of that. Like, I don't know why you guys, like, I I saw you guys all fucking going crazy with speculation, but there was nothing there. <laughs> Jesus. Like, he wasn't leading us? Man, no. that'd, be, uh, that'd, be, that'd be a real dick move on Rothfuss's part. I don't think he's going to go there, but... Uh. No, he probably won't. Probably won't. But, um, yeah, so that'll fucking wrap it up for this week, and then we'll be uh, back with more of uh, this crew in the Eld trying to find the bandits next week. Right on. All right. Fucking peace out. Yep. Yep.